Hey, what's up everyone? James here, and I hope you're having a fantastic day today. In this video, you're about to embark on an epic journey. This is the Transformers Autocracy Trilogy. This is written by Flint Dilly and Chris Medzen, and the artwork is done by Olivio Romandelli. This is a collection of stories set in IDW's Transformers universe before and in the early years of the Great War between the Autobots and Decepticons on Cybertron. The two leaders of these factions, Optimus Prime and the Mighty Megatron, will start them down a path that will lead them to an epic destiny. Now, one of the mistakes I made early on that I want to clear up before we get into this story is I called the first part of this series Autocracy, you know, because Autobot, Autocracy, I thought just assumed that's the way it was pronounced. It's actually pronounced Autocracy. Also, at some point when we get to the Quintessons, spoiler alert, I call them the Quintesson at some point in this video. So forgive me for that. Weird things happen when I record and I don't realize I made these mistakes. But other than that, I really hope you enjoy the video. Hit that like button, comment down below your thoughts of this entire trilogy once you get to the end. And if you are new here, subscribe to the channel if you want more stories focused on the Transformers. Other than that, let's get into the video. Hey, what's up everyone? James here, and the journey continues into the IDW Transformerverse. Universe 1, to be specific. Shout out to Silencer Zero for educating me on the different universes. So, before Optimus became a prime, he fought for order. Before Megatron became a conqueror, he fought for freedom. Before they were enemies, they stood against autocracy. We have done the origin of the mighty Megatron, origin of the heroic Orion Pax, and the origin of the fast is bought alive blur in order to get here if you're new here and you need to catch up i have a link to the playlist in the description box down below in today's video we are going to cover autocracy chapter one law and disorder so let's get right into it the story opens in the rust narrows of taurus city nyon with orion leading some familiar autobots ironhide bumblebee prow hound and there's one more you guys will see very soon they're on a mission to track down a Decepticon arms dealer named Swindle, who is moving munitions through Nyon sleeper cells. We see here how the Autobot Senate has failed this city. When Bumblebee mentions that Nyon used to be a great shining city, but now has been reduced to slums, and the bots who live here feel like the government has just left them to rust. The Autobots are able to track down Swindle to this warehouse, where we see he is selling Autobot phase chargers. Orion, Hound, and Ironhide burst through the warehouse door, Orion ordering them to lay down their arms and submit to custody. The bot Swindle was trying to sell the charges to grabs one of them, attempting to throw it at the Autobots, but Bumblebee quickly takes him out with a headshot. Swindle tries to escape during the firefight, and Orion radios Silverbolt, who provides cover from above, stops Swindle from escaping. Swindle, trapped, decides to just shoot wildly at the Autobots and the innocent bystanders. When Bumblebee says the civilians need to be protected, Swindle just mocks him, pointing out that the Autobots are the ones that are really crushing the people of Cybertron every day. Orion catches Swindle by surprise and demands to know everything about Megatron and the Decepticon terror cells. However, Swindle isn't giving up anything. He tells Orion how the Decepticons represent the new age and a new wave for all Cybertronians. And Orion replies that Decepticons new age is an age of murder and enslavement. And this is where Orion really loses it. He begins to beat the hell out of Swindle. Take notice, this isn't the Orion we met in his origin or in Blurs. He's changed. He knows he's fighting for a corrupt government that isn't for the people. And though it's slowly changing through Zeta Prime, it created the Decepticons through their own selfish actions. Swindle, being heavily damaged after this, says to Orion, You don't see it. You're so hell-bent on stopping the Decepticons. Take a look around you. Your system made us what we are. All these people are all Decepticons now. Face it, Autobot. You're not just part of the problem. You are the problem. Orion then pulls out his Ion Blaster, preparing to kill Swindle, but luckily Bumblebee stops him, pointing out to Orion that he beat an unarmed captive in front of civilians. No wonder why the people hate them. When Orion says he used necessary force, Bumblebee replies that he's lost control. 
and ask what's going on with him lately, but suddenly an explosion occurs. One of the stolen phase chargers was set off. After the explosion, Prowl notices the bomber escaping, but Orion orders him to stand down since they have Swindle in custody. He orders the Autobots to head to the Citadel, saying Autobots roll out. Who was secretly watching this whole thing transpire was Laserbeak. And that is the end of Autocracy Chapter 1, Law and Disorder. Today, we will cover Chapter 2, Parasites, and Chapter 3, The Hunt for Soundwave. So let's get right into it. The story opens at the Citadel in the Primacy Auditorium with Zeta Prime meeting with the Autobot Security Council, which consists of the Autobot Senate. He is speaking to them about the current situation on Megatron and the Decepticons. He mentions the terror they are spreading across Nyon and how Sentinel Prime failed to contain Megatron's rebellion, which we saw in the origin of Megatron. Zeta vows to break Megatron and restore order to Cybertron at any cost. However, one of the senators here tells Zeta that his officers have failed to find the Decepticon so far, and the people of Nyon are helping hide the terror cells. When Zeta says he'll root out the terror cells and do the same to the people aiding the Decepticons, another senator replies, saying he was meant to serve the people, not oppress them. And this is where my bubble, thinking Zeta was a good guy, bursts. He tells the senator the common Cybertronian despises him, that Decepticons recruit from Nyan's population without consequence, but he has prepared a weapon that can eradicate them once and for all. Zeta then reveals the Vampark Ribbon, designed long ago by Geoxys. Now, a quick note about Geoxys. He is one of the most badass bots. He's beaten Megatron and Optimus Prime, believes in creating a Cybertronian empire, a united Cybertron, and isn't aligned with Decepticons or Autobots. At least that's the case in the Marvel continuity when he was introduced. But that's just naming a few things. I would love to see him appear as a villain in an animated series or a live action film. But anyways, Zeta tells the senators that the Vampire Ribbon requires tremendous power. When the Senate asks where would they find this power source, Zeta replies, it lies within us, Senator, basically revealing that Energon is the power source. As he is about to demonstrate the power of the Ribbon, Starscream interrupts, arriving as a delegate for the proceedings. Zeta then reminds Starscream that he doesn't have to tolerate his presence like the Senators. Zeta then reveals to Starscream and the Senate that Swindle, who was just apprehended in Chapter 1, is going to be the test subject to demonstrate the Vampark's effectiveness. From there, we quickly go to the Citadel sparring room with Orion and Ultra Magnus, and this discussion they have is awesome. While sparring, we learn Bumblebee isn't the only one who has noticed Orion hasn't been the same lately. Ultra Magnus has as well. He asks Orion what's wrong, and Orion tells Magnus that Swindle's interrogation didn't reveal much, and he feels like he's failing. And Magnus tries to assure Orion, saying that everything will be over after they take down Megatron. But I love Orion's reply here. Orion replies, or will make a martyr out of him. Magnus, have you ever asked yourself if we are on the right side? I love this scene because we find out Orion's anger comes from his doubts about the Autobot government and the feeling that Megatron's cause is somewhat justified. If you guys don't feel like it is justified after watching my Origin of Megatron video, I don't know what to say to you. But anyways, we go back to the Primacy Auditorium and Zeta drains Swindle of his Energon to power the Vampark Ribbon, showing the Senate how it draws power from a bot's energon. Still, the energon once drained from the bot must be released, or it can overload the weapon. Zeta fires the ribbon into the auditorium ceiling, displaying the incredible power it can unleash. Zeta says draining combatants and using the devastating power of the ribbon creates a perfect circuit of death. Using this weapon isn't even the most sinister part of his plan. It gets worse. Zeta tells the Senate he's outfitted the Omega Destructors with ribbon units, and they will require greater power. The Omega Destructors Zeta refers to are giant guardian bots that are peacekeepers, and they're used to guard the cities of Cybertron and quell uprisings. One of the senators asks, where would they find this extra extra power, especially when Cybertron is in the middle of an Energon shortage. Zeta says he's thought about taking it from the citizens. What Zeta just said is so crazy that even one of the senators thinks he is joking. Starscream then asks, how does he propose on getting the citizens to volunteer their Energon? Zeta replies, volunteer? I fear you misunderstand me. I propose to reach out and take it after burning their enclaves to the ground. When a senator here says that that's 
that's unthinkable that the populace would turn on them if they knew such a plan was attempted, Zeta then reveals that his plan is already in action. He has been using Nyon as a test area. When one of the senators says he oversteps, Zeta replies, this security council has lost the will to do what must be done. That is why I was chosen to be prime, because I'm the monster the people need. Holy hell. When I read this, my mind gone. It just was blown up to pieces. Sentinel Prime might have been the gun-toting jarhead. Zeta Prime is showing himself to be a ruthless sociopath. Starscream approves of Zeta Prime's plan, which surprises Zeta, but Starscream almost accidentally blurts out that he has done worse in Megatron's name. In order to distract Zeta, he points out a Decepticon spy hitting among them, who is revealed to be Soundwave. With his cover blown, Soundwave goes to escape, and Zeta tries to shoot him with the vampire park ribbon but it overheats. Orion enters the room and Soundwave escapes. Zeta orders Orion to hunt down Soundwave and retrieve the data he stole before it can be revealed to the public. Orion replies, I'll bring him back sir, dead or alive. And that is the end to chapter 2 parasites. There's a few things to notice here. Notice that Zeta didn't tell Orion the information Soundwave stole at the end of the chapter. And notice how Starscream is the one who secretly brought in Soundwave. And the most important thing that was revealed in this chapter is the Prime, who brought about a good change in Orion's eyes, is truly evil. Whew. Now with all of that out of the way, let's go to chapter 3, The Hunt for Soundwave. But be prepared everyone because this chapter moves really fast, it's really action packed, alright? So the chapter opens with Orion gathering his team of Autobots. He informs his team that their target is Soundwave and is carrying intel that can't be allowed to be delivered. The Autobots then roll out, set to find Soundwave. The Autobots quickly deduce that Soundwave is heading toward the Kaon border controlled by the Decepticons. One of the interesting things the Autobots mention here is Soundwave is suspected of massacring the former Senate, which we saw him do in Megatron origin along with Starscream. Silverbolt looking from above spots Soundwave going through the factory district. Bumblebee and Hound move in. Soundwave ejects Ravage who is able to damage Bumblebee and Hound by himself. While being heavily damaged, Hound takes out Ravage before passing out. Ironhide and Prowl then spot Soundwave under Nero Span Bridge and go to move in but Soundwave unleashes Rumble who creates a seismic wave that collapses Nero Span Bridge on top of Ironhide and Prowl. We then go to a Orion in the crowded marketplace who is the next one to spot Soundwave running through it. Orion rams into him. Soundwave ejects Frenzy who creates a panic and hysteria among the civilians using his sonic weaponry. The citizens end up turning on Orion and Soundwave is able to escape. Orion orders Silverbolt to pursue Soundwave. However, Soundwave then unleashes Ratbat who quickly takes out Silverbolt's a port stabilizer. Later, with the Autobots out of the way, Soundwave and Frenzy are able to reach the Kaon border, but suddenly they're ambushed. Frenzy is shot from behind by Orion, and as Soundwave is about to eject Buzzsaw, Orion crushes his chest compartment, saying enough of that. Soundwave removes his shoulder cannon and beats Orion in the face with it and then spears Orion into a crater. Orion is able to knock him back and take out Soundwave. The rest of the Autobots arrive, and just as they're about to take Soundwave into custody, Skywarp and several other Decepticons appear surrounding the Autobots. Skywarp says, not so fast big guy, you aren't taking him anywhere, this isn't your jurisdiction anymore. I love Orion's reply here, he says, Autobots jurisdiction is what we say it is Decepticon, are we here to talk or fight? The Decepticons tell Orion that Megatron wants to have a sit down, and then after that they're free to go. But should he refuse, they have an order to shoot Bumblebee. Skywarp asks Orion, well Autobot, what's it going to be? And that's the end of chapter two and three of Autocracy. Hey, what's up everyone, James here. And today we are back with Autocracy chapter four, cause and effect. So this chapter opens in k at the entrance of the jump joint and we see a few Decepticons guarding it and one of the locals passes by and says to one of them to tell Megatron the locals are pulling for him. I like this a lot actually, because even though Megatron conquered k and took it from the 
Autobots, it shows that the locals despite that are on his side. We then go inside the jump joint where we see Megatron and Orion Pax are having a meeting. And Megatron is telling Orion how corrupt the Autobot government is, but Orion says he's always been aware of this. Megatron then calls Orion out on using his anger and cynicism to hide his idealism, when deep down he still truly believes the Autobot government can be changed from within. Orion tells Megatron he doesn't know him, and mentions if his Decepticon thug lays even a scratch on Bumblebee, then their discussion gets heated. I have to say, angry Orion Pax is growing on me. Megatron just smirks and says how it would be a shame if things turn violent, and tells Orion how he was impressed when he tried to challenge the government and proposes they work together. Orion refuses and just calls Megatron a criminal posing as a revolutionary, but Megatron quickly claps back saying you're a revolutionary posing as a cop, and tells Orion they would accomplish great things together. As they're having this discussion though, we learn Orion is expecting reinforcements when Ironhide calls him over the comp system to inform him that heavy transports are inbound and to continue to stall for time. Megatron reveals quite a bit here to Orion. He tells him that information on his team being an ion was leaked to him from someone on the inside. He then shows Orion the recording of the Autobot Security Council back in chapter 2 that Soundwave procured and shows him when Zeta said that he planned on taking the people of Nyon's Energon after he burned their homes to the ground. Orion asks Megatron why he showed him this, and Megatron replies that Zeta possesses a new weapon, which we know to be the Vampire Ribbon, and tells Orion Zeta will kill everyone in Nyon, including them. Orion tries to brush off Megatron, thinking what Megatron is saying is too far-fetched, but Megatron also reveals to Orion that Zeta Prime set him and his team up. He sent them into Nyon, hoping they would be killed so he could use their deaths as a pretext to invade. When Orion asks Megatron, what do you want from me? I love Megatron's response. He says, I want you to accept that your true enemy is the autocracy you serve. I want you to help me bring it all crashing down. Now before Orion can answer, Ironhide informs him over the comm system that reinforcements have arrived. Orion then kicks the table and yells Autobots attack. Suddenly, Hound pulling a Selene from Underworld comes crashing down through the ceiling, guns ablaze taking out Decepticons here. Proud joins the party blasting away as well. Megatron says to Orion, well played, I underestimated you. And Orion replies, you usually do. He then calls Ironhide who crashes Ashes through one of the walls, saving Bumblebee. Orion tells Megatron he's lucky his team comes first, but Megatron isn't phased at all. He says to Orion how he's been trying to take him down for three cycles now, and asks Orion how far he and his team will get when his army holds every sector. Orion replies, kicking Megatron in the chest, saying, far enough. The Autobots then blast their way out of the jump joint. Ironhide informs them that transport is inbound, and the transport is the greatest, strongest, and smartest bot alive, at least that's how he would describe himself, is Skylink's son, who says, load up boys, we're taking fire and the meter's running. All of Orion's team successfully get on board, but as Skylink's begins to fly away, Ramjet tells Megatron he's got a clear shot on Skylink's, but Megatron orders him to let them go, saying with what Orion has learned, he will do more damage to the Autobot cause than we can do in a hundred cycles. Later, back at Iacon in the Autobot Control Center, Zeta tells Orion he is an embarrassment to the cause because he didn't return with Soundwave's intel. However, Orion says he did gather intel, and then proceeds to tell Zeta he learned his plans to wage war against the citizens of Naya. And Zeta just says to Orion to not pass judgment on him and his actions, and tells Orion he lacks the subtlety and strength of a true leader. Orion replies, I think we were set up, but Zeta just brushes it off as an excuse. He tells Orion he has no time for his excuses and conspiracies, and threatens Orion should he fail him again, he will leave him to the Decepticons. Zeta gives Orion and his team a new mission, to apprehend an insurgent, the same one who bombed the warehouse after they captured Swindle. He tells them the intel that he's received has identified this bomber as someone new to the insurgency who's already proven to be cunning and fearless, and someone they don't want joining the Decepticons. Now, if you're confused as to why Zeta is referring to this insurgency group and Decepticons as two separate entities, it's because they are. Yeah, the Decepticons are essentially an insurgency group, but at some point between Megatron's origin and to now, another one was formed by some of the people of Cybertron. And I do wish Autocracy explained this in the beginning, or if there's a story I missed before Autocracy that explains this other insurgency group, please let me know in the comments down below. Now, back to the story. When 
When Prowl asks, do they have any leads? Zeta replies, just one. The mystery bomber's name is Hot Rod. And that's the end of Autocracy Chapter 4. Hey, what's up everyone? James here. And today we are covering Autocracy Chapter 5, ruins i absolutely loved this chapter because it goes into a lot of the history of cybertron so the chapter opens with orion and his team arriving at the acropolis in nyan's rust narrows where according to their intel hot rod has taken refuge we learned through the Autobots conversation that the Acropolis is an ancient building that was once the capital of ancient Cybertron, but has been abandoned for a long time. Ironhide thinks it could be a trap and Silverbolt agrees. Silverbolt informs the other Autobots that Hot Rod is enhanced for speed and precision, but who enhanced him is unknown. Orion orders the bots into formation and heads into the Acropolis. After walking through the ruins, the Autobots are fired upon by Hot Rod, who says he's been waiting for them and wants to see if they can keep up. Ironhide replies, keep up with this punk, as he fires his heavy cannon at Hot Rod. I thought this moment was so awesome. Hot Rod changes into his alt form and leaves the area. The Autobots chase after him and enter into this huge hall that Bumblebee says he once saw in a hollow vid about the ancient halls of order that were supposedly the seat of power for the Knights of Cybertron. Hound mentions he remembers seeing that as well and explains that the Knights were said to have watched over Cybertron before the Primes took power, ruling with wisdom and justice. Now what's very interesting is the Autobots look at the Knights of Cybertron as just myth and legend, wondering if they actually existed. It's very similar to our real world Arthurian legends. Historians still to this day debate whether King Arthur actually existed or is just a Celtic mythological hero. Hound says if the walls could speak, maybe they would learn about who they are and how to live. Like these ruins, he often thinks that he and the people of Cybertron today are the Forsaken. As the world the Knights of Cybertron rule he believes had to be better than theirs. As Hound is being poetic, Ironhide points out an inscription on the ground that says, true freedom exists when all are one. Now the phrase when all are one, or often said as till all are one, is a phrase embedded and often said throughout the Transformers mythology and legends. And basically what it means is all bots together are one when they shed their factional affiliations, or all are one when they all return to the Allspark of Primus, who is basically their god. After reading the inscription, Hound discovers plasma mines all around the chamber, but Prowse says none of them are armed, and if they were, it could have taken them out at any time. As the Autobots continue to traverse the ruins, they come across faint energy readings, and these energy readings lead them to eventually discovering a shrine in the shape of the Matrix of Leadership. Like the Knights of Cybertron, the Matrix is also regarded as myth and legend. According to Hound, the Matrix represents hope and peace, and that the Knights vow to protect it forever. But many bots today do not believe it existed. However, Prowl believes it exists and explains that it has been handed down to Primes for thousands of generations. In Ironhide's opinion though, this is all just propaganda to keep common bots in line, especially since Zeta doesn't seem to be a person who's powered by hope and life. Orion tells the group enough that Hot Rod is just using all this to bait and draw them in. However, Hound thinks that isn't the case because Hot Rod has had plenty of chances to take them out, but hasn't, and believes maybe Hot Rod is trying to show them something. Laserbeak, watching from the shadows as the Autobots traverse the ruins, is transmitting a live feed to Megatron at Kokular, the Decepticon base of operations. As Megatron praises Hot Rod for leading the Autobots on a clever chase, he tells Starscream it is a shame he did not recruit him. Remember that Starscream is one of the Decepticon recruiters. We saw him try to recruit Blur and Spotlight Blur. Whether he is a Decepticon or not, Starscream tells Megatron he will finish off the Autobots, something you have repeatedly failed to do. The fact that Megatron didn't immediately choke Starscream to death after he said that is strange to me. But anyways, Megatron's response shows why he is the leader of the Decepticons. He says, as usual, you missed the point. Orion is about to see the truth and and when he does, all hell will break loose in Iacon. The Autobots finally reach the heart of the Acropolis, 
and discover a room full of Energon tanks. Suddenly, the doors behind them slam shut. The Autobots are ordered into defensive formation by Orion. Hot Rod approaches the Autobots, informing them that the tanks are highly volatile. He welcomes them into the heart of the Acropolis, saying once the shining center of the golden age of Cybertron, but now is a den of rust and suffering. Orion asks, what's this all about? Hot Rod replies, look around and tell me what you see. As the Autobots look around, they see so many bodies of bots drained of Energon. Orion slowly realizes this is all Zeta's doing. Hot Rod tells Orion he has helped Zeta with his plans and explains that bots are dying and there are facilities like this all over Cybertron. That the government is bleeding the people dry and that's why the insurgency was formed to fight back. Orion asks why show them this and not kill them. Hot Rod replies because I believe you're different and not like your prime. Orion asks what makes you think that then Slinger enters the room, telling Orion they believe he's different because he called out the Senate on their corruption, and like the Knights of Cybertron, believes in justice. That Harrod brought him here to prove it. Harrod says, I won't resist. Arrest me or stand with us. It's your choice, Autobot. Make it count. Later, we see Orion, Bumblebee, and Prowl out on the balcony of the Acropolis. They're discussing on what to do next. Bumblebee believes it's time they admit that the Decepticons aren't the real problem, and Prowl takes this as Bumblebee suggesting they join the Decepticons, but Bumblebee asks Orion what they should do, and Orion points out to them the fire on the horizon, and says that's our future burning. We then see Zeta has already made his move. The Omega Destructors are burning Nyon to the ground. As Orion watches this, he says, we're all out of choices now. And that's the end of Autocracy Chapter 5. Hey, what's up everyone? James here, and today we are back with Autocracy, covering two chapters, Chapter 6, Purge, and Chapter 7, Choices. Now, let's get right into it because this story gets crazy. So, Chapter 6 opens with the Omega Destructors and Zeta Prime himself fitted with Vampark Ribbon Units burning Nyon to the ground. Zeta announces, Dissidents of Nyon, you've been branded traitors to the Autobot regime. This wretched slum will be blamed lead of Energon so that Cybertron may thrive. Be not dismayed, your sparks shall serve the greater order. Your future and Energon shall live within us. Zeta then drains some nearby citizens of their Energon. Meanwhile, at the Acropolis, Orion tells the Autobots it's time to move out and Hot Rod to evacuate the citizens. When Hot Rod says they're in no condition to evacuate, Orion replies, you're their leader now. Find a way or they all die. Megatron watching Zeta's madness from Decepticon HQ at admits he didn't expect this eagerness from Zeta and is interested in seeing how Orion will handle this crisis. Later at the battlefront, Orion comes up with a plan to slow down the Omega Destructors since they have no chance of taking them out. The plan is to lure them into the Rust Narrows and see what damage they can do. Hound will lay down mines, Ironhide will use his Cyclone Launcher, Bumblebee will be sniping from a rooftop, and Orion and Prowl will act as bait. Orion orders the Autobots to roll out. Prowl and him quickly grab the attention of one of the Omega Destructors who fires upon them. The Omega Destructor steps on Hound's mines, and Ironhide and Bumblebee lay down all the firepower they have at the Omega Destructor. Orion asks whether they got him, and Ironhide believes the Omega Destructor isn't getting up after taking that beating. However, when the dust settles, the Autobots see they didn't even lay a scratch on it. Bumblebee points out civilians running by, saying they won't stand a chance and ask Orion what his orders are. Orion replies, fall back. There's nothing more we can do. We can only hope we bought Hot Rod enough time. Meanwhile, on the outskirts of the Acropolis, Hot Rod is in disbelief of the destruction Zeta has brought and realizes he and the evacuees won't make it in time. Slinger reminds him of their contingency plan, which Hot Rod reveals was to wire the entire city of Nyon with phase chargers. When Hot Rod says, I just never thought it would come to this, Slinger replies, better that our people die at our hands than to be drained to serve Zeta. And initially Hot Rod hesitates, but then says, Primus, forgive me, and regretfully activates the phase chargers. Explosions then occur all across Nyon, and the Omega Destructors fall and burn with the city. Orion and his team get caught in one of the explosions, and Hound points out that the explosion came from one of Hot Rod's phase charges. Orion realizes Zeta had this planned all along. And when he says Hot Rod had no options, out of nowhere, Zeta comes crashing down in front of them and says, 
now neither do you. Zeta quickly takes out Orion's team and he tells Orion as he told him long ago, it's not about being on the right side, but the side that's going to win. And Orion does his best and charges at Zeta, saying you haven't won yet, Prime. And Zeta replies, yes I have, as he takes out Orion with the Vampark Ribbon. Zeta Prime has won. From there, we go to chapter seven, Choices. And the chapter opens with Zeta standing over a defeated Orion about to deliver the killing blow, saying it hurts me you should die in the ashes and wreckage. But suddenly, Zeta Prime is interrupted by Megatron with his army of Decepticons at his back. I have to say this entrance is so cool. He orders his troops to protect the Autobots and says, leave Zeta to me. Zeta, excited to crush Nyon's insurgency and Megatron at the same time, immediately fires his Vampark Ribbon at Megatron. But one of his Decepticon Seekers sacrifices himself to protect Megatron. I love that Megatron didn't even move an inch while witnessing all this. Like, this is so cool. He tells Zeta he knows all about his Vampark Ribbon. He throws some nearby civilians at Zeta, causing his Vampark Ribbon to overload. With the Vampark Ribbon no longer a threat, Megatron asks Zeta, ready to face me in a fair fight? Now, not wanting to fight Megatron without his weapon, Zeta turns and flees the battle, cursing Megatron. Megatron calls him a coward and says, this isn't over. I'll make a long career out of killing crimes. Now, you cannot tell me that isn't badass. This was so awesome. Megatron orders his troops to bring the Autobots back to base. Later, at Decepticon HQ, Orion Pax thanks Shockwave for repairing him, never thinking he'd see the day a Decepticon would save his life. Megatron then enters the room, telling Orion they still have great things to achieve together, and mentions they never finished their conversation from Chapter 4. Orion admits to Megatron that he was right about Zeta Prime, and Megatron takes notice of the chasm within Orion's chest, and tells him it's time to fill that chasm with a new purpose. Now, don't forget about this observation by Megatron, because it will play a significant role later. Megatron makes an excellent point here in his discussion with Orion. He tells Orion his new purpose should be justice. He has seen with his own optics the evil Zeta is capable of and the autocracy that condones it. Nyon was the first to fall and there's no going back now. When Orion asks how can I possibly trust you, Megatron replies, do you even have a choice? From there we quickly go to Starscream, telling Orion's team that they're free to go. Ironhide and Thundercracker have a friendly standoff here and I like this because it's the young cocky soldier versus the gun-toting veteran. Shockwave enters the room and announces that everything has been discussed and decided and for the Autobots to follow him. Later we see Orion and Hot Rod and Hot Rod is surprised that Orion has agreed to work with Megatron but Orion tells him that the destruction and death Zeta has caused needs to end. And we then see Hot Rod is like full of regret after having to destroy Nyon. And I love Orion's response to this. He reassures Hot Rod by saying, leadership is making the hard choices. The price we pay is carrying guilt, loneliness, and self-doubt. You give it your all, but sometimes it seems like the world just gets darker. You faced an impossible situation and did what you had to do. You had the strength to make a choice, just as I do now. Orion and Megatron have officially joined forces. And that's the end of Autocracy Chapter 6, Purge, and Chapter 7, Choices. Hey, what's up everyone? James here. Hope all of you are having a fantastic day. Today we are back with Autocracy, covering two chapters. I know I said I'd be covering three chapters, but the ending of chapter nine is so amazing. And I thought that's a perfect way to end a video. And you'll see what I mean when we get there. And I'm pretty confident that you'll agree. Plus I thought ending Autocracy with a three chapter video would be awesome and a better idea. But anyways, let's dive into chapter eight overthrown. So the chapter opens in Iacon at the Citadel with Zeta Prime and the Autobot Senate. One of the senators informs Zeta that his recklessness in Nyon has only strengthened Megatron and his supporters. Zeta tells the senator that Megatron and all of his Decepticons would be no match for his Omega Destructors. Another one of the senators tells Zeta that his arrogance will damn them all. And that besides Megatron, Orion Pax and his team are still unaccounted for and are a significant threat. Zeta snaps at the senator, saying that the traitor Orion has been crushed. He's no threat. Suddenly, the Citadel is under attack. Initially, Zeta doesn't believe it because he believes it'd be suicide for anyone to attempt this. But then when the Citadel receives another bombardment, he orders the Vampire Cannons and Omega Destructors to be activated and for Ultra Magnus to come to him. Outside the Citadel, we see the combined might of Megatron and Orion's forces attacking. Hot Rod and Blitzwing are leading the attack on the Vampire Tanks 
trying to destroy the Omega Destructor's power source and keeping the bulk of the Citadel Autobot Defense Forces occupied. Bumblebee tells them that the assault teams are taking heavy fire from the turrets and need air support. Hot Rod informs him that they're already inbound. We then see Starscream and his fellow Seekers in all of their glory coming in for a strafing run. Starscream orders Skywarp to teleport, Thundercracker and Ramjet to take out the Vampire Cannons. After they successfully take out the Citadel's turrets, Astro Train flies over the Citadel roof so Megatron and Orion can airdrop in. Once they drop in, who is standing there waiting for them is Zeta Prime with his Vampark ribbon at his side. He says, Megatron, Orion, this I did not expect. You could have stood at my side as masters of this world. Now you'll die at my hands, remembered as terrorists. When Megatron replies, no, liberators, Zeta fires his Vampark weapon, striking Megatron. Orion yells, no, steps into the Vampark's bean and rips the Vampark ribbon unit off of Zeta's arm. Zeta says, Orion, you have some stealing you after all what a waste orion's response is so badass he replies with all due respect sir you're boring me already and uppercuts zeta however zeta quickly responds by ripping orion's arm off while saying officer pax your service is concluded and completely takes orion out of the fight meanwhile the combined forces of megatron and orion are still keeping the autobot forces occupied broadside radios to hot rod that the omega destructors and an autobot squad are closing in on him bumblebee sees this squad approach and who's revealed to be leading this squad is Ultra Magnus and alongside him are Cup and Springer. Ironhide steps to Magnus and asks, after all Zeta's done, is he going to stand with him? Ultra Magnus reveals that he's seen the evidence against Zeta Prime and says if this Prime is going to be brought down, now is the time. Suddenly they're attacked by one of the Omega Destructors and while they're firing at this Destructor, Cup informs them that the Destructor's weakness is its seam junction in its underbelly. Back within in the Citadel, Megatron is beating the brakes off Zeta Prime while saying, not so tough without your Vampark weapons. At least Sentinel Prime wasn't afraid to get his hands dirty. I love this because Megatron is showing respect for an old rival, and he is right. Sentinel Prime, who by the way is still my favorite looking Prime of them all, was no slouch. Back in Megatron's origin, he was on the front lines leading his fellow Autobots in the battle for Kaon and went toe to toe with Megatron. Zeta grips Megatron's head and says like this, your reign of terror is over Megatron. Megatron replies, no, it's only just begun and shoots Zeta Prime in the head with his fusion arm cannon. Megatron stands victorious over Zeta's burning dead body. At the battlefront, Starscream tells Ironhide that Icon's defense has been crushed and Prime's troops are in full retreat but one Omega Destructor is left, giving them a problem. Ironhide says, it sounds like it's time to call in the heavy gun. Starscream then orders Shockwave to concentrate full power on the last Destructor. Shockwave literally one-shots an Omega Destructor by himself. That is insane. Within the Citadel, as Orion rises to his feet, Ironhide radios in, informing him that they've completed their mission. Orion tells Ironhide to send in Ratchet with the engineering crew because he and Megatron are in bad shape. Megatron says that won't be necessary and shoots Orion in the back while saying you and your Autobots have served your purpose. While Orion's body falls into this deep cavern within the Citadel, Megatron's last words to him are, goodbye, Orion Pax. Megatron's reign has officially begun. From there, we go to chapter nine, transformation. Now, before we get into it, I want to let you know that I changed the arrangement of this chapter. Now to avoid spoiling anything, that's all I'm going to say. And I'll say what I did after the chapter is over. Now with all that out of the way, let's get into it. So the chapter opens at Iacon's Trion Square. Megatron announces to the people of Cybertron that the autocracy is broken. And he says, the oppressive rule of the primes is over. Now begins a new age of order and justice for all. After telling the people of Iacon, Icon that the Decepticons now control Icon's data net and defense grids, he declares that they are the law and will keep the peace. Megatron offers amnesty to the Autobots who wish to join the Decepticons in rebuilding their once great society, but those that don't will be dealt with. Just like in Megatron's origin, I like that Autocracy also is showing that there's more than meets the eye when it comes to Megatron. You guys see what I did there? I like that it shows that he isn't this straight up mustache twirling villain. You know, that he is smart and intelligent. In this instance right here, he's showing the people of Cybertron that he isn't like Zeta at all. He's giving them an opportunity to join him, even those that fought against him. 
At the Autobot safe house in Taurus City, Ultrix, Ultra Magnus, Bumblebee, and Ironhide are discussing what to do now that Orion's dead and that Megatron has taken over. Bumblebee is having a hard time believing it. Ultra Magnus mentions that most of the officers have gone to ground and they don't have enough soldiers to form a resistance. And Ironhide is determined to just go down fighting despite the odds against them. Bumblebee tells Ironhide that it's suicide and that they should get out of the sector and get some backup. Hot Rod enters the safe house interrupting their conversation and telling them that there is no safety out there anymore and that the Decepticons will find them. Bumblebee kind of pulls a dick move here when he says to Hot Rod maybe we should detonate the whole city, that'll take care of them right? And Hot Rod replies don't judge me, I did what I had to do, but maybe it's time to make a different choice. When Bumblebee assumes that Hot Rod means joining the Decepticons, Hot Rod says, Autobots, Decepticons, none of it matters now. My people are dead because of this war for control. The violence will never stop. Maybe it's time we woke up to the truth. Bumblebee believes that Megatron's amnesty is a trap, just a ploy to lure them in and take them all out, and suggests forming a resistance. All of a sudden, they hear a creak, and soon realize their safe house is compromised. When the Decepticons burst their way into the safe house, saying you're all under arrest, but by all means try and resist. The Autobots do their best to fight back. As Ultra Magnus and Ironhide lay down suppressing fire, Ironhide orders Bumblebee to take the tunnel. Hot Rod and Bumblebee take the tunnel, but they find Ramjet and his fellow Decepticons lying in wait for them. The Autobots end up surrendering, and as they're about to be transported, Starscream stops Hot Rod, and he tells Hot Rod he knows how hard he fought for the system and knows what he sacrificed, that if he truly wants to avenge his people, he should join them. When Hot Rod asks what will happen to the other Autobots, Starscream says, that's up to Megatron, but I doubt it'll be pleasant. From there we go to far beneath Iacon in the undergrid, where Orion Pax lies, not dead, but broken. His spark hasn't yet gone out. Orion says in his inner monologue, I have failed. I was Orion Pax. Now I am nothing. Neural circuits nearly fried. I can't even register pain. All I can feel is a pull, a pull toward an energy source that's familiar, yet somehow elusive. Orion begins to crawl towards this energy source, and it leads him to discovering an ancient vault. Once a part of the Citadel, Orion enters and sees the Matrix of Leadership. As Orion moves closer to the Matrix, he begins to hear a voice in his mind, so much like his but older and wiser, calling out to him across time, an echo of the future. This voice says, everything you've experienced, everything you are, has led you to this moment. Now reach out and take a hold of the flame. Suddenly Orion is flooded with so many emotions, searing pain, fire, panic, and fear. Orion realizes everything he is feeling is the emotions, the sparks of the people of Cybertron. He can feel their pain, their grief, their loneliness. He can feel the bitterness of devastation and loss. His consciousness starts to expand and stretch out across Cybertron. New feelings start to flood his mind, courage, selflessness, and hope. These sparks are few, but they burn bright against the darkness. Orion realizes that the Matrix doesn't only represent leadership or creation, but the sparks of all Cybertronians. The Matrix enters Orion, firing arcs through his ravaged circuits, burning, purifying, infusing him with power. Orion says, the Decepticons believe we are divided people, that only absolute control can unite us. That's the greatest deception of all. Within this matrix, all are one. In every moment, we stop to recognize something of ourselves and each other. Unity isn't some hope for event, it's a matter of perception. All these long millennia, we Autobots fought to uphold a crumbling system that forgot its most sacred truth, that freedom is the right of all sentient beings, freedom from oppression and fear. I see that if our people are to survive, we Autobots must change what we've been fighting for, and that change must begin within me. So I will lay down my life and my identity for my people. Orion Pax is no more. I am Optimus Prime and I have a world to set free. And that is the end of Transformers Autocracy Chapter 8 Overthrown and Chapter 9 Transformation. You guys cannot tell me that wasn't a great ending. So what I did with Chapter 9 Transformation was, it was going back and forth between Orion and the Autobots. So I decided to just go through with all everything that was happening with the Autobots and then just end it with everything Orion or now Optimus Prime.
So, we have finally reached it, my friends. Today is the finale, the epic conclusion to Transformers Autocracy. This is going to be a long one, but before we get started, you know I have to say this. Hey, what's up everyone? James here. If you are new or behind on this story, check out my Transformers Phase 1 playlist. I should have the card pop up right here, and it will be in the description box down below. Now, with all of that out of the way, let's dive into these final chapters, starting with Chapter 10, Rise. So the chapter begins within the Citadel, now controlled by the Decepticons. We focus on Hot Rod here being escorted to see Megatron. I should have mentioned this in the last video, but Hot Rod has joined the Decepticons. And this isn't one of those situations where he's on a secret infiltration mission. Hot Rod took Starscream's offer from the last chapter and chose a side. And the reason he did this is because he really feels lost. Hot Rod doesn't know what he's fighting for anymore. Through his inner monologue, we learn this, and we also learn that he never wanted to choose a side, that he wishes he could go back to simpler times and just fight for the people of Nyon. But we know that is impossible anymore. Nyon is gone. He was forced to destroy it in order to prevent Zeta from gaining more power. We also learn he views his decision to join the Decepticons as a mistake because he sees they won't bring the long lasting peace that Cybertron needs. He meets with Megatron and they have this great conversation. Megatron praises and compliments Hot Rod on sacrificing Nyon in the fight against Zeta and tells him that Zeta would have become unstoppable if he hadn't done that and that a true leader acts without doubt or regret. That the leaders who carry those qualities are weak. Hot Rod replies, funny, Orion told me the same thing. Now Megatron's response to this is interesting. He reveals that he saw Orion as a fool blinded by idealism and that the only worthy opponent was Zeta because he was ruthless. I think this conversation is incredible because it parallels well with Hot Rod's conversation with Orion back in Chapter 7. It shows us that both Megatron and Optimus believe in the same thing, that a leader needs to have the strength to make hard choices. However, where they differ is Megatron feels caring doubt and regret that may come from that hard choice makes you weak. At the same time, Optimus considers it the price you pay as a leader. And going on a quick tangent here, to be honest, I'm more aligned with Megatron's way of thinking. because. Self-doubt will affect your ability to be decisive in the future. And guilt, though sometimes it is justified to carry, for a time, it can also be a slippery slope. Holding it long enough can lead to depression or a guilt complex, and that cannot be the case when you're in a position where people's lives are in your hands. Those are my thoughts, but let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. Now, back to the story. We quickly go to Optimus Prime near the outskirts of Iacon, and he's confused by the Matrix because it's pulling him towards Nyon, and he can't imagine anyone survived Zeta's purge, but he intends to find out. Meanwhile, we see Starscream bringing Bumblebee to Megatron after torturing him. He informs Megatron that Bumblebee knows nothing. However, Megatron reveals that torturing Bumblebee wasn't about gaining information, but about breaking him into submission. But when he realizes that Bumblebee can't be easily broken, he orders Starscream to have him and the rest of the Autobots executed. Later, we go to the detention cells, where we see Thundercracker and Dirge taunting the Autobots before their execution. Hot Rod approaches, informing Thundercracker that Megatron wants the Autobots to remain alive now. But the ploy doesn't work, Thundercracker calls him a lion sack of bolts, and Hot Rod then shoots the prison cell console, freeing the Autobots. Now, some of you may remember, Ironhide and Thundercracker have beef. They were about to fight in an earlier chapter. Ironhide breaks free out of his cuffs and smashes Thundercracker's head against the wall while saying, told you this wasn't over. When I read this, I was like, that's what you get, son. Talk, get hit. Now, Hot Rod's reason for saving them when asked by Bumblebee is he saw for himself that Megatron is worse than Zeta, since he just wants everyone beneath his heel. I would argue though that at least Megatron's cruelty comes from years of discrimination, his people being treated as a lower class, and witnessing his people being massacred and unfairly imprisoned. I would say that's a lot more understandable than Zeta Prime, who was just ruthless because he wanted to keep his power. Hot Rod tells Bumblebee he doesn't want his people to have died for nothing, that they would have fought for freedom if they could have. And he finally sees that's what Orion and his team have been fighting for all along, and asks to join them. So Hot Rod officially becomes an Autobot. Now with Orion gone, Bumblebee mentions that makes Ultra Magnus the ranking officer, but Magnus isn't willing to give up on Orion just yet. Bumblebee is of the same mind and hacks a nearby security console in order for him to track Orion's ID code. Once he follows it to Nyon, the Autobots immediately roll out. 
As they escape the Citadel, they're stopped by the Decepticon Battle Chargers Runamuck and Runabout. But they're not stopped for long when out of nowhere an explosion occurs and we see the pre-wreckers Cup, Springer, Prowl, and Hound come to save their fellow Autobots. Now they're not the wreckers yet, but I just wanted to call them that. And really only Cup and Springer eventually become members of the wreckers. I'm pretty sure Prowl and Hound have never been members, but I could be wrong about that. Let me know in the comments down below. From there, we go to Optimus, reaching Nyon. Through the Matrix, he can feel faint pulses of life deep beneath Nyon. Optimus says, where there's life, there is always hope. He continues his journey through Nyon until he reaches the Acropolis. He can feel the sparks of the people of Nyon that were snuffed out, devoured by fear and violence, the very same things that have taken control of the people of Cybertron. Optimus soon realizes the power he feels pulsing beneath Nyon is an ancient and noble power waking. The senseless loss deeply grieves this ancient power. The Matrix calls out to it and it stirs. Suddenly, Optimus is approached by his team, having tracked him to Nyon. Bumblebee says, you're supposed to be dead. But Optimus replies, I was dead inside, but no longer. I'm back and know what I need to do. Bumblebee points out that Optimus sounds different and Ironhide asks if they will take the fight to Megatron now. Optimus answers that they first need to get their bearings, and he proceeds to give them an awesome speech. He says, Autobots, brothers, long ago we took oaths as officers to protect the people, but as times grew grim, we let the rule of law crush them. We lost our way. With the Decepticons in power, our people need us now more than ever. We need to bring them justice and freedom. When Bumblebee and Hot Rod mention they're outgunned, outnumbered, and don't have the power to fight, but Optimus replies, opening his chest, saying we do right here. Optimus reveals the matrix of leadership. The Autobots are shocked, but Bumblebee points out that only a Prime can hold the Matrix. Optimus says, I'm a Prime now, Optimus Prime, and I've been given a second chance to set things right and fight for a better world. Will you stand with me? Bumblebee is the first to answer, saying I'm with you Optimus till all are one. Now, whatever you are doing right now, stop and listen closely. Optimus says to the Autobots, before we roll out, there is someone I want you to meet. Someone who suffered through the ages of fire and death and dream through long eons of history. He shall not rise as the Acropolis, a forgotten ruin of a lost age, but as an embodiment of our shining future, a symbol of a better world we will forge together. Arise Metroplex. Dude, when I read this, I was like, oh my God, I can't believe it. I was just like going off the wall seeing this. But I really love this because for those of you who've been following the phase one playlist, back when we covered Spotlight Orion Pax, he thought Metroplex left the planet eons ago and even doubted he was real. Alpha Trion revealed to him that Metroplex was very real. And Metroplex right now is one of the major plot points of Shattered Glass. And Shattered Glass 2 is coming soon, so I hope we get to see him in all his glory in that series as well. Well, that's the end of Chapter 10, Rise. From there, we immediately go to Chapter 11, Broadcast. And it opens where we last left off in the ruins of Nyon. Metroplex greets Optimus saying, it's good to see you again, old friend. And this confuses Optimus because from his point of view, this is their first meeting. But like the voice who spoke to him across time when he discovered the Matrix, the voice that sounded familiar to him, Metroplex mentions that he has always known him, maybe under a different name and time, but explains that history repeats itself with clockwork precision and that there's always someone like him ready to battle against the chaos. Optimus asks Metroplex for his help in the desperate fight against Megatron. And Metroplex agrees to help, but first would like to help the survivors of Nyon. Optimus tells the Autobots they need to rally everyone, and he knows who exactly can help with that. Later, we go to Tor City Triax at the underground pirate station Nexus, where we see Blaster, and I'm so glad we're finally seeing him. At this point in time in the story, Blaster is not associated with Decepticons or Autobots. He's actually a former reporter for the Iconian Newsfeed Service, and he left that position because of his bad experiences with government censored media. So, in order for him to report the truth to the people of Cyber, like corruption scandals and information the government hides, he set up his pirate radio station Nexus. Right now he's speaking out against the Decepticons, thinking they won't be able to stop him. However, unbeknownst to Blaster, his Decepticon counterpart, Soundwave, was able to locate his position. We see Breakdown and Wild Rider are here to assassinate him. 
and their assassination attempt doesn't really last long. Optimus takes them by surprise and knocks them out. Blaster thanks Optimus for the save and assumes he wants him to spin the standard Autobot propaganda as payment, but Optimus tells Blaster that he's always been a voice of the people and they need to hear the truth. Sometime later we go to Skylinks, and I have to say I'm disappointed with how little Skylinks has been utilized in this series so far, because he's one of my favorites and I think he's awesome. He drops off the Autobots along with Blaster at the Iconian Newsfeed Service headquarters. With Blaster's help, the Autobots hijack the newsfeed in order for Optimus to transmit a message all across Cybertron, where we'll see some familiar faces and other faces we have yet to meet. With the signal reaching everywhere, Optimus begins his speech. He says, my fellow Cybertronians, you once knew me as Orion Pax, an officer of our corrupt Senate that grew increasingly oppressive, but that day is done, taking with it the broken shell of the bot I once was. I speak to you now as Optimus Prime, not elected by ancient ritual or committee. I do not serve any faceless bureaucracy. I serve you, the citizens of Cybertron, and as sure as the Matrix burns within my frame, I will never stop fighting for your freedom. The Decepticons rule from Iacon Citadel, thinking their numbers and guns can keep you in line. Don't believe the lie. The real power lies in you, lies in unity. The ancients believe that true freedom exists when all are one. I call upon you to prove it by joining me at Iacon. We will march upon the Citadel and show Megatron that the Age of Tyrants is over. We shall reclaim the Autobot name and restore its pride and honor as one. Later, after Optimus's message, Megatron is shocked to hear that Orion is alive, but believes his message won't change anything because the people fear him too much. However, Megatron is quickly proven wrong when he sees Optimus marching upon the Citadel with a massive army at his back. And this is awesome. Seeing this, Megatron says to Starscream, I don't care if you have to kill every bot in this city, this ends now. Hold on to your seats, everyone, because this is when the battle begins. Bumblebee points out Starscream and his Seekers coming in for a strafing run. The Seekers drop bombs on top of the Autobots, and Optimus tells them to hold their ground. As the Seekers prepare to attack the Autobots again, they are surprised by someone we haven't seen in a while, Silverbolt accompanied by a group of aerial bots, saying these Seekers are about to learn who rules the skies. Optimus then orders the Autobots to push forward to the Citadel. One of the bots mentions that the Citadel's guns will pulverize them and asks if they should fall back. Optimus replies, we stand or fall as one. He raises the Autobot banner from the ground and says, either we win today or lose our world forever. I will not let the Decepticons have it. He yells at Megatron saying, do you hear me? It's over. Megatron replies, it will take more than words to stop me, more than you imagine, Optimus Prime. And that's the end of chapter 11 broadcast. Now we have made it to the end of Autocracy, chapter 12, Endgame. Let's not waste any more time and go right into it. The chapter opens with the battle between the Autobots and Decepticons still raging on. Megatron receives an update on the battlefront from Blitzwing, who tells him that the assault forces are advancing on the Autobot lines. Megatron changes plans plans, displaying his great strategic ability by ordering Blitzwing to hold his position and fire barrages behind the Autobots in order to keep them in the same position for this surprise he has for them, which will be revealed soon. Meanwhile, we go to the battlefront. As the Decepticons begin their barrages on the Autobots, pinning them in the same position, Bumblebee points this out to Optimus and says they need reinforcements. What follows next is one of the most badass entrances in this series. Oh my god, I'm so hyped. All right, suddenly the Dinobots arrive with Grimlock leading the charge saying, Dinobots, this is our fight now. And it doesn't end there. With his burning Energon sword in hand, Grimlock slices through one of the Decepticon tanks and the rest of the Dinobots take out the other tanks. Like, oh my God, this was amazing. I love the Dinobots. We then see some other bots who heard Optimus's message arrive. And you can see blur in the background here. I like that. As another barrage comes in, Trailbreaker uses his shield to protect everyone. We then see the Citadel begins to change, revealing Megatron's surprise, the Vampark Annihilator. He says, behold, the final legacy of Zeta Prime. This weapon looks super menacing. He fires the Annihilator into the center of the Autobots forces, killing so many, causing the Autobots to flee for their lives. When it seems like the battle is lost, Metroplex joins the fight. 
Optimus reveals he called him before the battle and held him in reserve until Megatron made his big play. Metroplex transforming out of his city form says the Vampark weapons insult those who forge Cybertron and shall be silenced. As Metroplex draws all the Decepticon firepower towards him, Optimus orders the Autobots to charge forward for freedom for Cybertron. Now what happens next was kind of surprising to me. Megatron fires the Vampark Annihilator at Metroplex and it has zero effect on him. Like the Vampark's beam literally bounces off of him. Metroplex then grabs the Citadel and rips it apart. This sends Megatron falling, landing in the city streets. Standing there waiting for him with his Ion Blaster and burning Energon Axe ready for battle is Optimus Prime, saying you could have led our world to freedom and fulfilled the promise of your ideals. Instead, all you brought was death. Megatron replies, no one can deny their true nature, not me or you. The fight between them begins with Optimus laying the smack down on Megatron, saying, one shall stand, one shall fall. Hot Rod sees the fight playing out and despite Megatron's best efforts, loses the battle against Optimus. Unprepared for how strong Optimus has gotten, Optimus holds Megatron at gunpoint, showing mercy and asking him to surrender. Surprisingly, he still wants to work with Megatron, believing both of them together can heal the wounds of their divided people. Megatron plays like he's gonna surrender, but secretly grabs a nearby hidden blaster. Hot Rod sees this and tries to stop him, but ends up being his hostage. Megatron says, foolish move, boy. Hot Rod replies, only move I make, and changes into his alt form escaping Megatron's grip. Optimus says, you were warned, and fires his ion blaster at Megatron. Now the blast didn't kill Megatron, but it did heavily damage him. Megatron says, you think you've won? You just started a war, the likes of which this world has never seen. Soundwave flies in aboard Astro Train and grabs Megatron, successfully escaping. At the same time in Tryon Square, Shockwave orders the Decepticons to retreat. And you see the Seekers flee and get a great view of Metroplex towering over Iacon. He is just huge. Later after the battle, we learn through Bumblebee's discussion with Hound and Slinger that Metroplex went back to his city mode over the ruins of the Citadel, becoming Icon's new capital, that the survivors of Nihon will become chroniclers, cataloging Cybertron's history. From there, we go to Ultra Magnus and Prowl, showing Optimus something that they've discovered. And what they discovered was a hidden storehouse of illegal weapons, outlaw designs, and prototypes stockpiled by Zeta Prime and the Senate. And Prowl suggests using the weapons to end the Decepticons once and for all, but Optimus refuses. He says, these are tools of subjugation that led to Zeta's destruction. I won't make the same mistake. Destroy it all, every last piece. We go to a sort of epilogue here, seeing this discussion between Optimus and Hot Rod. Optimus thanks Hot Rod for saving him and for opening his eyes. However, Hot Rod believes he isn't a hero and doesn't deserve any thanks. And this is Hot Rod displaying that guilt complex that I talked about earlier. But in this case, it is justified. This is the guy who had to kill his own people. I love Optimus. Optimus' response to this. He says, you took a stand and followed your heart. If you're not a hero, then I don't know what is. Hold your head high, Autobot. After all, you could carry the Matrix one day. And I love that because he's making Rodimus see that despite everything he's done, he is still a hero and he is worthy enough to carry the Matrix of leadership. But with that being said, that is the end of Autocracy. God, this was amazing. This story was just absolutely incredible. And guess what? This isn't really the end. This story is actually a trilogy and we've only covered the first part. Next in the trilogy, we will be covering Monstrosity. The Transformers will return after these messages. Hey, James here, and I hope you're enjoying the video. If you would like to be a big part of this channel's content and have behind the scenes access to the channel, go ahead and join my Patreon. I have two tiers, each with an array of benefits. The link will be in the description box and in the pinned comment down below. With that out of the way, let's get back to the video. We now return to the Transformers. What's up everyone, James here. Now if you guys thought Autocracy was crazy, you have no idea what you're in store for when it comes to monstrosity. I will cover two chapters in this video, but with a little twist. So when it comes to each chapter, they constantly go back and forth between Megatron and the Decepticons and Optimus and the Dinobots. 
I thought it would be cool to cover Megatron and Decepticons first and finish up with Optimus and the Dinobots. Eventually their stories will converge, but until then I want to try to avoid going back and forth. I really want to make this story seamless for you all. Now with that explanation out of the way, let's get into Megatron's journey into hell. So remember, we last left off with Megatron being defeated by Optimus Prime. Even though he was able to escape, he didn't leave unscathed, he was heavily damaged. The story takes place sometime after Optimus Autobots won the battle for Iacon. We go to deep space with Astro Train transporting Scorponok, Starscream, and a damaged unconscious Megatron. Now, this isn't Beast Wars Scorponok, this is original G1 Scorponok, who is dangerous. He first appeared in Marvel's Transformers Headmasters issue 1, which takes place millions of cycles after Optimus and Megatron left Cybertron and continued their war on Earth. Even though they left, the war didn't end on Cybertron. It continued with Scorponok leading his sect of Decepticons and his rival Fortress Maximus leading the remaining Autobots. I like that Chris Metzen and Flynn Dilly introduced him to the story a lot earlier. Through this discussion between Scorponok and Starscream, we learn Scorponok plans to take control of the Decepticons. Instead of publicly executing Megatron on Cybertron as Starscream suggested, Scorponok wants to make Megatron's death so legendary that no one would dare to challenge him. He plans to banish Megatron to this world that's considered a nightmarish myth, and any loyal Decepticons who will come to try to save him will share his fate in this world. Once they arrive above the planet, Scorponok throws Megatron from orbit to the planet below, called the Death World Junkion a world filled with junk zombies and scrap eating monsters. We will learn the history of this world later on in the story, but in the meantime, after Megatron crash lands on the planet, he refuses to just give up. He rises from the crater and says, I am not dead, but broken, defeated, betrayed, but unconquered. I am Megatron. The junk worlders notice Megatron and like vultures, they are eager to feast on him. Megatron sees them approach and says, I am supreme, let's do this. I want to point out how this is such an amazing, amazing parallel to Orion after Megatron betrayed him. He also refused to give up and was reborn as Optimus Prime when he found the Matrix of Leadership. So we are witnessing Megatron's journey to his own rebirth and it's incredible. Now back to Megatron facing these junk zombies. We know even a heavenly damaged Megatron isn't going down easily. His life as a miner, as a gladiator in the pits of Kaon, and his battle experience have made him super resilient. When these natives of Junkion attack him, Megatron starts taking them out one by one. Now as he is overwhelmed, one of them is able to saw his arm off, but that doesn't stop Megatron. He grips this bot's head and squeezes it. Enraged with one arm, takes out the rest of the bots like that. After the battle, he ends up collapsing. Meanwhile, in Kokular, at Decepticon headquarters, Scorponok announces to the Decepticons that Megatron has fallen and declares himself their new leader. He tells them that Megatron lacked the discipline to bring his dream of unification through control to fruition, and that's why he has punished Megatron by banishing him to Junkion. He asks the Decepticons who dares challenge him, and no one does at least until the Terracons appear. Hungar speaks out against Scorponok, calling him a coward. So for those of you who don't know who the Terracons are, they are a subgroup within the Decepticons whose members consist of five animal bots. As we see here, we have Cutthroat, a Griffin, Ripper Snapper, a Land Shark, Hungar, a two-headed dragon, Blot, a mole-like creature, or some people consider him an ogre, and Sinner Twin, who is a two-headed dog. They first appeared in the Headmaster miniseries working for Scorponok. One thing I want to mention that's so awesome is both in Monstrosity and Primacy, we're going to see more subgroups like this within the Autobots and the Decepticons. Another thing I should mention is if you're like me looking forward to seeing the Transformers Rise of the Beast film, we will see bots named the Terracons being led by Scourge as the primary antagonist. Unfortunately, they won't be in their animal forms because set images reveal that they have vehicle all forms. In all honesty, I think they're just using the Terracon name to describe one of the many factions we'll see in the film. 
So the reason why Hungar views Scorponok as a coward is because he didn't truly defeat Megatron and take leadership from him, just merely banished him. The Decepticons in a way live by the same philosophy as the Necromongers in Chronicles of Riddick, you keep what you kill. Scorponok was just hoping that by banishing Megatron to a nightmarish world and his size and reputation as a gladiator would be more than enough to intimidate and strike fear into any Decepticons who would dare challenge him. However, Hungar makes an excellent point here when he basically says that true Decepticons rule by fear and are not ruled by it. Before the Terracons leave, Hungar declares that they will go to Junkion and finish off Megatron, and when they return, they will deal with Scorponok. Back on Junkion, Megatron has awakened, and some of his systems are failing him. It's hard for him to focus and block out the pain. Regardless, Megatron is supreme. He says this world of wreckage will provide all I require. I am more than the sum of my components. I am the cold hand of vengeance. Megatron uses junk parts and wreckage around him to patch himself up. He rises wearing mismatched body parts and a new deadly looking arm, saying I will show the denizens of this world what hell really is. Now from here I want to return to Cybertron to the Autobots. In k we see Strongbox and Nightshift transporting goods to Iacon until suddenly an explosion occurs knocking them out. The culprits behind the blast are revealed to be the Dinobots. I won't go into a long explanation about the Dinobots, but for those of you who don't know, they first appeared in the original Transformers cartoon. And in the show, they were actually created by the Autobots. Their image was designed by Wheeljack and Ratchet using dinosaur fossils found by Ironhide in a volcanic cave. We just see three of the members here, Grimlock, who is the biggest and baddest of them all, in my opinion. On the right, Swoop, and on the left, Slag. Now, initially, this might be confusing for some of you because we last saw them coming to the aid of Optimus during the battle for Iacon, giving us one of the most badass entrances ever. They mention how Swindle tipped them off about this shipment. Now, they've turned to committing crimes like this because they're trying to quickly earn enough credits to get off world. You may be asking why they are trying to get off world? That will be revealed in a later chapter. They go through the shipment and see it's half of what Swindle said would be in it. Afterwards, they pay him a visit, threatening to turn him over to the Autobots. But Swindle informs them that Decepticon Intel hasn't been the same since the defeat of Megatron. Some of you may remember, last time we saw Swindle, he was actually being used by Zeta to show the Vampire Ribbon's effectiveness in front of the Senate. So I guess he survived when it seemed like he died. Grimlock lets him go, just in case they need him later on, and he says that the longer the Dinobots stay on Cybertron, the more they jeopardize the people of Cybertron. So the situation for them is dire. At Metroplex, we see Optimus Prime holding a Grand Convocation, which is basically a meeting of representatives of the various factions on Cybertron that are neither Autobots nor Decepticon. This is Optimus Prime's attempt at instituting a democratic form of government, while at the same time trying to unite the various factions and guilds on Cybertron. Because as he puts it to the representatives, Cybertron's people need solidarity now more than ever. The main representative who isn't quick to trust Optimus because of his past history as Zeta's enforcer is Die Atlas here, who represents the Circle of Light, a group of pacifists who have sworn off any form of war. However, make no mistake, these guys are dangerous when they want to be in a fight. You'll get a glimpse of that in this series. Die Atlas interrupts Optimus, telling him that he won't be exchanging one tyrant for another. And he even views Optimus having the matrix of leadership as an affront. Bulkhead, who is the main representative of the Engineering Guild, argues that Optimus brought down Megatron and has earned his role as leader. Optimus does his best to end the squabble by telling them they need to trust each other and focus on finding solutions to the problems they face right now, which is still the Energon shortage we learned about back in Autocracy and the recent rise of Decepticon attacks, which we know they're now being led by Scorponok. Die Atlas argues that the Autobots have failed on both fronts, and he then tries to walk away from the convocation, but Optimus convinces him to stay, at least for now. Later we go to Optimus heading into his quarters, where he discovers Alpha Trion has been waiting for him. This is awesome because the last time we saw these two together was Spotlight Orion Pax. Through their discussion, we learn that Alpha Trion has been watching Optimus, and he compliments him on doing well so far in the political arena. 
but Optimus doesn't feel like he has been doing well. He brings up the fact that when he was reborn with the Matrix, he felt such surety in everything he did. We saw that firsthand, a supremely confident Optimus Prime who didn't hesitate. But now that the guidance and influence that came from the Matrix has faded, it's left Optimus to rely on his own instincts. That's what he's having a hard time dealing with. What's also been hard for him was he thought the hard part was defeating Megatron. That after the Autobots took over again, it would be easy uniting the people. However, after the convocation, he realizes he was wrong. Alphatron reassures Optimus by telling him that the convocation was a great idea, since it shares authority with the other factions, and when it comes to the people, he must help them see beyond their divisions. Alphatron also answers Optimus's unspoken question. Is he worthy of the matrix of leadership? And Alphatron says, that is something you must answer for yourself. Sometime later we go to the rust bucket with the Dinobots, where Swoop mentions about a job that's higher profile. This eventually leads to an argument between Slag and Grimlock. Swoop stops them from fighting when he mentions what happens to them when they lose control. Remember this because it is important and it has to do with why they want to leave Cybertron. When Grimlock asks Swoop about the job, Swoop explains that the job is a refinery heist, and the buyer is willing to pay triple. Grimlock agrees to do the job. Cycles later, we go to the Taraxxus mega refinery with the Dinobots breaking in. We see Sludge and Slag busting in, facing some drone resistance. They're waiting on Snarl to bring in the tanker. No matter how many drones they take out though, they just keep coming. They quickly realize they have to be controlled by someone. When the sentry commander reveals himself, Grimlock sneaks up from behind and takes him out. Slag asks Grimlock what they're going to do since Snarl still hasn't revived yet with the tanker. Grimlock just answers, hunker down and prep for a long night. We got fuel to steal. And that's the end of Monstrosity Chapter 1 and 2. What's up Beyonders, James here, and we are back with Transformers Monstrosity. As we did in the last video, we are starting off with the Decepticons again. So we start off with Megatron traversing Junkion's howling waste as this ionized acid rain comes down, burning through his plate. Megatron says even the storms in this world can kill. Despite that, Megatron wants to keep moving Moving, but he ends up deciding to wait out the storm in this wrecked starship. As he enters the ship, this voice calls out to him to step into the darkness, and Megatron asks this voice who they are. The voice answers, I am in exile like yourself, a king without a throne. I am called Pentius. Now this is awesome and here's why. Pentius is a quintesson, specifically a quintesson judge, who is the race's leaders. Their physical characteristics consist of five rotating faces, representing different aspects of their race. So you have Pentius' current face representing death. The other four faces have different meanings depending on who you ask. So we have the face of wrath or rage. You have the war face, or some people will say the smiling face, the face of wisdom, and the last one is the face of judgment. Others will say doubt, but I think judgment is more fitting because it's more in line with the nature of what quintessen judges do. It's no surprise we are seeing one of their kind in this story because Flint Dilly, who co-wrote the Autocracy trilogy, was a story consultant on the Transformers 1986 film, where they made their first appearance. Pentius tells Megatron that he's been trapped on Junkion for hundreds of years within his starship's wreckage and claims he knew he would come. He tries to warn him that the way off Junkion is dark and twisted, but Megatron says, I fear nothing. Pentius replies as he switches to the face of wrath, perhaps, but to survive this monstrous world, you must become monstrous yourself. From there, we return to Kokular, shortly after Scorponok took control of the Decepticons. Through his discussion with Starscream, we learn that they're aware that Optimus formed a convocation with the various faction leaders, and that it really didn't go well. They also know the convocation's plans to restore Energon to the Taurus states. Starscream wonders though where they would get more Energon since Zeta and his Vampark weapons drain the emergency reserves. This is when Scorponok reveals to him his plans to steal the Energon from the Taraxxus Mega Refinery that holds 8 billion megaliters of refined Energon. Now they're not aware that the Dinobots are currently stealing from the facility, but Scorponok's plans are not just to steal it, it's a lot worse. He wants to throw the global Energon production into all-out chaos. 
because that will make the Convocation tear itself apart over the scraps, leaving Optimus and the Autobots easy prey. Back at Junkion, Megatron surmises that the planet must have a spaceport. Pentius, having studied the schematics of the planet, informs Megatron that the Pillar of Rust, a massive mound of wrecked ships and waste, may hold the answer, but the only safe passage is through the eye of the acid rainstorm. Megatron asks why anyone would travel to this forsaken world. Pentius explains it's to hunt, to be tested. Everything about Junkion is cruel. It's a place of terrible purity, where only the strong and unmerciful can survive. He tells Megatron he must face its challenge or be devoured by it. I love this so much. I love this journey Megatron is on. But I want to mention that there is much more than meets the eye here. Yeah, I said it. We'll learn what that is eventually. But in the meantime, Megatron frees Pentius and then wraps a chain around him. He tells him he will be his slave and guide him to the Pillar of Rust. Later they reach the corroded shore, an acid sea that lies between them and the Pillar of Rust. Pentius urges him to proceed cautiously because the acid sea can eat through anything, but Megatron fears nothing. He reminds Pentius of the chain around him, and if he should fall, so will he. As they begin to cross, Pentius warns him something stirs in the sea, and boom, the Shartakons come leaping out of the sea and pull Megatron in. Now Pentius doesn't get pulled in because Megatron released his grip. The Shartakons are pretty cool. They are bots with a head and teeth resembling a shark with a round body and a spiked mace tail. Now they are called the Shartakons, but they act more like piranhas. A group of them will swarm their prey and tear it apart. Moments later, we see Megatron rise out of the acid sea with one of the Shartakon's spiked mace tails in hand, bashing one of them with it and tearing another with his bare hands. But he's eventually overwhelmed by them and pulled back into the sea. From here, we go to the Dinobots at the Terex's mega refinery. Snarl at some point finally arrived with the fuel tanker. Slag mentions to Swoop that it's now at capacity and how if they really were criminals, they could live like kings off this score. However, Swoop reminds him that they really wouldn't be able to because they'll cause serious damage if they snap. We'll see what that looks like pretty soon. It's coming. Grimlock interrupts their conversation, basically telling them to shut up and keep working. He and Slag go at it again which leads to Slag storming off. Now I want to quickly transition from the Dinobots to Optimus Prime, who we see is meeting with Die Atlas at the Autobot sparring arena. Optimus is trying to get Die Atlas on his side because remember in the last video, he spoke out against Optimus being the new Prime. So Optimus is trying here to gain his support. He starts by reassuring him that he isn't Zeta Prime. He will fight to protect the people of Cybertron, but in order to do that, he needs soldiers, specifically soldiers with integrity and character that the Circle of Light can reach. Die Atlas refuses because he doesn't want his followers to die for the sake of his crusade. Optimus points out that the Decepticons will mistake the Circle of Light's pacifism for weakness and hit them all worse than before. Optimus' words anger Die Atlas. When his next sparring sequence begins, Die Atlas activates his wrist sabers and takes out all these sparring bots in just one move. I told you guys you were going to get a glimpse of how dangerous these guys can be. Now you and I would describe what the Circle of Light practices as pacifism, but Die Atlas wouldn't call it that. He explains that it's patriotism. He knows combat, knows the terrible cost of war, and unrestrained hatred. He believes violence will only lead to more violence. Later in this video, I will explain why I have an issue with Die Atlas's reasoning for not helping Optimus. In the meantime, back at the Terax's mega refinery, Dawn approaches, and the Dinobots have successfully filled their tankers. However, this victory is short-lived. When the Decepticons arrive and attack them, the Dinobots fall back to the refinery. Grimlock orders Swoop and Snarl to give him cover. When he realizes they can't escape, he decides to make a call. Slag enters the fray by ambushing Dirge and Ramjet, blasting them through the chest and taking them out. Scorponok approaches, telling Grimlock and the Dinobots that they have gone from pit champions to street thugs, that they should have run when they had the chance. Grimlock informs him if they left, they would have missed him and the Decepticons get their butt kicked. When Scorponok says it's ridiculous that Grimlock believes he and the Dinobots can take them, Grimlock reveals he wasn't talking about the Dinobots, he was talking about the Autobots. We then see Skylynx flying in, roaring. Once he lands, he unloads the Autobots. Optimus leads the charge and yells Decepticons surrender and prepare to be taken into custody. 
Ironhide, Bumblebee, Ratchet, Ultra Magnus, and surprisingly, Die Atlas are by his side. As the battle between Autobots and Decepticons begins, Grimlock orders the Dinobots to fall back into the refinery. An enraged Scorponok wanting to give revenge on Grimlock orders Starscream and the Seekers to hold their position and keep the Autobots distracted until Tankor is done fueling. Optimus notices this, so he orders Ironhide to secure the area and asks Die Atlas to help him apprehend the terrorists. Die Atlas, of course, refuses, stating that he's here to observe and see the cost of Optimus's war. It's here I want to bring up my issue with Die Atlas. He calls this patriotism, but in all reality, it's pacifism. The refusal to participate in a war or commit any act of violence and be opposed to it. Look, pacifists are admirable, but only if they're right. I would agree with that position if this war were between Zeta Prime and Megatron. The war between them wasn't justified and both sides committed atrocities and were willing to do anything that would lead them to victory. Initially Megatron's cause was justified as I've mentioned before, but over time he became like the enemy he hated and wanted to rule Cybertron through total control. That isn't the case with Optimus, he is genuinely trying to repair the damage done to Cybertron and unite the people, especially when the situation on Cybertron is dire. Die Atlas is unwilling to put aside his personal morals for a justifiable war that would help the planet and its people. I would like to know what you guys think about all this. Now as the Dinobots are within the refinery, they're surprised by a blast from Scorponok and his Decepticons. Scorponok orders Blitzwing to fire at them again, but Grimlock convinces him to do it himself. The gladiator match of the century, Grimlock vs Scorponok, begins. Now the fight between them goes back and forth. When Scorponok gains the upper hand, he recalls their days as gladiators, telling Grimlock how he was one of the greatest gladiators, and Megatron thought he had so much potential. This is one of the missed opportunities in my opinion in the origin of Megatron series. Not going into detail on Megatron's life as a gladiator, it would have been cool to see his hardships and his relationships with other gladiators. We know Megatron and Grimlock must have known each other because we saw Grimlock Grimlock and the Dinobots at Megatron's secret meeting calling the Gladiators of Kaon to join him, Grimlock becomes enraged and he stabs Scorponok with his burning Energon sword. And it doesn't end there. He slices his hand off and smashes him in the face. Grimlock begins changing into a mindless beast, his alt mode triggering as he says kill. Swoop and Snarl see Grimlock going berserk and hold him down. So this is the Dinobots great secret. When they become enraged, their dino alt mode begins to take over, turning them into wild beasts. A future chapter will reveal how they came to have dino alt modes. Grimlock begins roaring, kill you all. Optimus appears and shoots him. Once Grimlock gets a hold of himself, Optimus informs him that he knows about him and the Dinobots, how they've been off the grid for a long time. He asks about this disturbing alt form, since it isn't in their file. Grimlock reveals that it's the reason why they need to leave Cybertron. He pleads with Optimus to let them go. And this is where Optimus makes a major mistake. He refuses because the Dinobots have not only broken the law, but are just as dangerous as the Decepticons in his eyes. Die Atlas tries to even convince him to let them go, but Optimus still refuses. Grimlock desperately dives toward the Taraxxus Mega Refinery's fusion regulator, threatening to deactivate it. He says, you should have just let us go. There's no Cybertron for us anymore. I'm so sick of all your petty factions and moral posturing. I hate it, and this monster inside of me wants to make you all pay. Optimus tries to convince him to stand down by telling him that if he deactivates it, thousands of Cybertronians will die from the explosion's fire. He reminds Grimlock that the Dinobots once served the people as a primal vanguard. He asks Grimlock to please serve them and stand down. Grimlock backs down and admits he doesn't want to hurt anyone. Suddenly, Scorponok dives toward the Regulator, laughing while saying, Disappointing as always, Grimlock, but you were right about being a monster. Deep down, we're all monsters. Optimus yells no, but it's already too late. Scorponok deactivates the Regulator and the refinery explodes. All we see is a flash of light. I hate to leave you all on a cliffhanger, but that's the end of the video. We now return to the Transformers. Hey, what's up everyone? James here and we are back, continuing our journey into Transformers Monstrosity. 
Before we get into this video, I want to shout out Y'all Day 8 for leaving an awesome comment on my full story video of Autocracy. He respectfully explained to me that I've been pronouncing Autocracy wrong this entire time. So I was saying Autocracy, but it's actually pronounced Autocracy. Also, shout out to King Larry, he also pointed that out. It's funny to me that I made so many videos on the first part of this trilogy and they were the only two who pointed out to me that I was saying it incorrectly the entire time. It's mostly my fault, but again, thank you to you both. So when it comes to this next part in Monstrosity, we will start again with the Decepticons because honestly, these following two chapters focus more on the Autobots. So I want to finish up with them. So we pick up with Scorponok and Kokular, what seems to be days after he blew up the Taraxxus mega refinery. He is surrounded by the bots who fell in the battle for the refinery. Now, if you're wondering how Scorponok and Optimus's forces, who we'll see later, survived the blast since they were all at ground zero, I can't tell you because it goes unexplained. Flint Dilly and Chris Metzen play fast and loose here with the story. Let me know in the comments down below how you guys would explain it. Now, Scorponok orders the Decepticons not to mourn the bots who fell because they're failures, to just forget them and take the best of their parts and dispose of the rest. When one of the injured Decepticons points out that it's only by chance they survived, Scorponok disagrees. He believes it was fate. He says the strong survive and the weak are crushed beneath them. When this bot mentions that even Megatron respected those who died in his service, Scorponok tears his head apart, saying, I respect only power. From Kokilar, we transition to Junkion. Remember in the last video, Megatron was overwhelmed by the Sharktacons and pulled into the depths of the Acid Sea. He comes bursting out of the sea and tells Pentius that the Sharktacons let him go. Now, two questions I want you all to ask yourself. The first question is why did the Sharktacons let Megatron go? And second, why did Pentius remain? Like I said in the last video, there's more going on here. So Pentius, who's fascinated at Megatron's survival, tells him he may yet survive Junkion, but he must learn the planet's most critical lesson. If he doesn't, Cybertron will meet the same fate. This is where Pentius tells Megatron the history of Junkion. He explains that the Junkions were a beautiful yet narcissistic race who squandered their potential because they preferred laziness and avoided working hard to advance and grow their civilization. In time, they ended up depleting their resources and they tried to survive by selling off their wealth. However, it was already too late. This couldn't save their world. Once the last of the Energon was gone, their great engines self-destructed, and the devastation didn't end there. The self-destruction caused a gravimetric pool that sucked the debris from space and rained down all over Junkion, shattering the last remnants of their civilization. The Junkions that survived were left to live constantly scavenging to survive, becoming the junk zombies that live today. Megatron refuses to believe Cybertron will meet the same fate. He points out that the Junkions were fools that lacked vision, that he will reclaim Cybertron, and his rule, his legacy, will last forever. Pentius asks Megatron what drives him, and Megatron answers, dominance, because that is the only truth in life. Which in Megatron's world, it really is, it's what has gotten him this far. Pentius praises him and says, good, you're learning after all. Oh my god, man, I just can't wait for you guys to see the next set of chapters because the end of Megatron's journey here on Junkion is so damn good. Everyone who knows, please don't say anything. Oh man. Okay, so from here I want to go to the Autobots. Blaster is reporting on the explosion at the Taraxxus mega refinery. The report he's broadcasting claims Optimus responded to a Decepticon attack and engaged a small group of unaligned mercenaries. So Optimus is protecting the Dinobots, keeping their identity out of the media. Blaster mentions that Optimus talked down this unidentified mercenary leader from exploding the facility, but then the new Decepticon leader Scorponok triggered the core's meltdown of the facility and the explosion killed thousands in the surrounding area and destroyed one of the last sources of Energon. At Metroplex, Optimus is holding a funeral for the missing people and presumed dead. In his eulogy, Optimus remembers those lost, but also says to the leaders of the various factions that they can't be divided anymore and need to unite, to remember their oath to lead the people of Cybertron even when times are darkest. To no one's surprise here, Diatlas doesn't seem entirely pleased with Optimus's speech. 
Later, he visits Optimus at his quarters, and Optimus admits that he feels like everything is falling apart and blames himself. I will give Die Atlas credit here, he does try to reassure Optimus. He points out that, though he carries the matrix of leadership, he still has his limits. However, when Optimus states that he will protect the people, Dialis tells him he cannot protect them from the Energon shortage, he's already failed to protect them, and that the only choice left for the people of Cybertron is to leave. This angers Optimus, and rightfully so, because Die Atlas wants to just abandon the planet. Optimus argues that the people's destinies lie on Cybertron, that he still believes that Cybertron can be saved and things will turn around. He tells Die Atlas that he has the power to stop him from leaving, but Die Atlas reminds him that action would only help escalate the violence and go against his belief in freedom. He says, perhaps your last greatest command as Prime is to let your people go. We quickly go to the Taraxxus blast site. Grimlock is seemingly disoriented and wandering around looking for the other Dinobots. Back at Iacon, the Great Exodus has already begun. Blaster is interviewing Die Atlas, and through the interview we learn that tens of thousands of Cybertronians are using the last of their Energon to find a new home. So Optimus ended up agreeing to Die Atlas' request and other Cybertronians who wish to leave. Blaster asks Dialis if this is what he wanted, and he answers that it's not what he wanted, but Cybertron is nearly dead, to let the warmongers fight over the ash and wreckage. What I don't like that Atlas does here is put everyone in a basket and essentially say, you're all the problem, you're all the warmongers, and I'm the peaceful one. When in reality, the only warmonger, the only one causing nothing but destruction, is Scorponok. Yet he doesn't directly criticize him or the Decepticons at all. Blaster asks Atlas if he's given up on Optimus' idea of unification and if he has faith in his ability to turn the situation around. Die Atlas says he hoped, which we know isn't true because he didn't give Optimus a real chance or help him. He uses the Taraxxus incident as to why all the factions should give up on Cybertron and leave. Optimus is listening to the interview with Bumblebee, and though he agrees with Dialis's point that if there is no Energon, there is no life on Cybertron, but he isn't giving up until he exhausts every option. He reveals to Bumblebee that he sent Jetfire and the science team to the Taraxxus site. That's where we go next, the Taraxxus crater where the explosion occurred. The science team consisting of Jetfire, Wheeljack, Ratchet, and Perceptor. They're searching for survivors and eventually go even deeper into the crater. Searching through the caverns leads them to discovering these ancient hieroglyphics on the walls depicting bots fighting against giant monsters. They wonder if it's from the Knights of Cybertron's era. Suddenly they're hit by an earthquake, sending them to the lowest level. And the discoveries don't end there. They find a vast reservoir filled with Energon in its rawest state. Quickly deducing it predates the refinery by millions of cycles and could power Iacon for thousands of cycles. Perceptor and Ratchet begin to study the bed of Energon and discover this Energon is self-replenishing, something never found before. However, they also discover certain particles that their equipment can't classify. Out of nowhere, they're hit with another tremor, forcing Ratchet to fall into the Energon. Ratchet comes out of the pool looking like a crazed lunatic. He pounces on Perceptor and starts choking the life out of him until Jetfire and Wheeljack get a hold of him. Now luckily he does regain his senses quickly. He mentions that the Energon is primal, which overwhelmed his inhibitors, causing him to go berserk. At that moment, they hear a roar and multiple strange beasts coming toward them. They have no weapons to defend themselves, so Jetfire orders them to run. As that craziness continues, I want to transition back to Optimus at Metroplex. This is where we learn the Dinobot's origin. Optimus calls Cup in for a meeting to ask him about everything he knows about the Dinobots. Because Cup, after all, is the oldest soldier, having served under a few primes. Cup explains that they were part of the Primal Vanguard under Nominus Prime. He doesn't say this, but Cup was also in the Primal Vanguard. He was just a part of a different team. When it comes to the Dinobots, they were a six-man team of heavy weapons, demolitions, and sabotage. They were the best and had a perfect service record until they disappeared. The rumor, as Cup puts it, was they went AWOL after completing their last mission, but all mission records were classified and buried. Optimus opens up the sealed files, and we learn they were the Vanguard's covert strike force. 
deployed in over 200 secret missions under Nominus Prime. Their last mission had them sent to the Taraxis Plains before the refinery was built. The mission was to investigate the rumors of an underground terror cell. They found no terror cells, but did encounter monstrous, cybermorphic predators living in the underground caverns. Despite their skills and heavy artillery, they had no chance of survival. So Scar, the team's medic, who before joining the team was researching dynamic alt mode adaption theory, Scar had the team test the idea in the field. During the battle, they took on aspects of the creatures and survived. However, Scar was killed in the fight. Once they returned, Central Command gave them psych evals that suggested his death snapped something in the team. So they were quarantined indefinitely. Their new monstrous forms were studied in order to try to re-engineer Scar's dynamic adaption. Eventually, the Dinobots staged a daring escape and have been on the run ever since. We know they were basically hiding in plain sight as gladiators in the pits of Kaon. Now there is more to the story here, and that will get revealed later. Cup tells Optimus they need to be put down, and Optimus agrees that that would be the logical thing to do, but he believes they are soldiers worth saving. Meanwhile, in the Taraxis Caverns, the science team is running for their lives. The Predators catch up to them, and one slashes Jetfire's chest plate. They start getting swarmed until Ratchet busts a hole into the next cavern. Ratchet notices that the creatures aren't following them, like they're afraid of something in the cavern. The team sees a giant structure deep beneath the planet's surface. Jetfire flies below to get a closer look and discovers it's not a building, it's a Titan. And not just any Titan, it's the monstrous Titan of Death, Trypticon. Jetfire says, I think we just stumbled upon a heap of trouble. And that's the end of the video. Hello my friends, my fellow Beyonders. We are back with Transformers Monstrosity. We're going to speed things along and cover three chapters in this video. And this video is going to be insane. We are going to open and end with a bang. I'm so excited. Okay, so we're starting with Megatron and Pentius. Finally reaching the point in the story I've been waiting to bring you all. God, I'm so excited. They reach the Pillar of Rust. However, Megatron realizes there's no trace of any functional ships or evidence of other travelers. Initially, he believes Pentius lied to him, but Pentius advises him to be patient, that he's meant to be at this moment because destiny is at his side and it comes to embrace him. At that moment, a ship enters the planet's atmosphere. As the ship lands, Pentius asks Megatron, how he will take the vessel since his energon is nearly depleted. Megatron admits that that's the case, but he doesn't care. He just charges toward the ship, going in for a full frontal surprise attack. But he stops in his tracks when he is surprised to see the Terracons disembark. Hungar greets Megatron, saying, We've come a long way to end you. For your failure of leadership, your weakness, for all time's sake, we'll give you a head start. I love Megatron's response. He replies, You're making a colossal mistake. So just to put things in perspective for you guys, we have Megatron, who was already severely damaged from his fight with Optimus back at Iacon, from Scorponok's betrayal being thrown into Junkion's orbit, and his battle with the Junk Zombies. Afterward, he was luckily able to patch himself up with some scraps, but then he had to traverse the hellscape of Junkion and battle the Sharktacons. Despite that, even when the odds are heavily stacked against him, you never, ever count the mighty Megatron out. The Terracons begin to encircle him, debating on who gets first blood. Ripper Snapper demands to get the first bite. He charges toward Megatron, who meets him with a boot to the face. Wasting no time, Megatron grabs Cutthroat and slams his body into block. Three down, two left. Sinner Twin leaps onto Megatron's back, taking a bite out of him. And the blow seems to be fatal, but Pentius pushes Megatron at this moment. He says, death is upon you, your strength is fading, and your energon bleeds from your circuits. Will you let these traitors defeat you? Is this all that remains of your indomitable will? Megatron roars and rips one of the heads of Sinner Twin. Just when he regains the upper hand, Hungar enters the fray wrapping his jaws around Megatron's torso. Pentius taunts Megatron as he's getting tossed around by Hungar like a rag doll. He says, you're cornered and depleted and cannot match his power and fury. Megatron in rage yells, shut up damn you. He knocks Hungar back 
and Pentheus continues to taunt him, saying, the beast will recover to have come so far and have such a disgraceful death. What happens next is why Megatron is the mighty Megatron, why he's so freaking awesome, why he's one of my favorites. All right, so sorry, I'm so excited. Megatron replies, Pentheus, you can still be of service to me. He rips Pentheus apart and takes his spark while saying your vile spark will provide me all the power I need. He combines Pentheus spark with his own and Pentheus' last words to him are, at last, the student becomes the master. You have truly become monstrous. At that moment, Hungar rises and roars, I'll feast on your servos. With the power from Pentheus spark, Megatron claps back, transforming into his alt mode, and says, you'll feast on my alt mode and blast a hole into Hungar's chest. God, this moment is incredible. Megatron, standing victorious over Hungar's body, asks him, who does he serve? And Hungar answers, Lord Megatron. He tells Megatron he doesn't deserve to live and begs him to end him. Megatron agrees, but instead of ending him, he offers Hungar and the rest of the Terracons an opportunity to serve him again. Hungar informs him of Scorponok's reign over the Decepticons, and Megatron only says, Scorponok's reign will be short-lived. Gather your warriors, I have a world to get back to, and a throne to reclaim. You cannot tell me that wasn't awesome. Okay, so from there, we're going to transition to the Autobots. Jetfire is reporting his discovery of the Tainted Energon and the Titan, Trypticon beneath the Taraxis crater to Optimus. Though the Energon is tainted, it can be refined to save the planet. And what's interesting here is that Jetfire did more research and found that the Knights of Cybertron were the ones who sealed Trypticon there long ago. The problem Optimus is facing though is he can't gather or refine the Energon without waking the Dragon Titan. So the only choices are to find a way to contain it or destroy it. Optimus orders the science team to find a way because they're running out of time. Later we go to the radiation wastes at Taraxis. Cup is searching for the Dinobots, telling them that they no longer need to hide, that Optimus is different from all the other primes before him. Grimlock reveals himself, but is hesitant to trust any prime. Cup eventually convinces Grimlock, but he doesn't want to leave without the rest of the Dinobots. At that moment, the rest of the Dinobots appear, revealing that they survived the blast. They agree with Cup that maybe Optimus is different and tell Grimlock that they don't want to run anymore and that Scorponok has to answer for his actions. A few cycles later, we head to the Icon Star's Reach spaceport. Prowl's security unit is helping keep the Exodus moving forward. Blaster is interviewing the people's experiences so far, trying to leave the planet. Let's just say the people aren't happy at all. One of the bots Blaster interviews mentions how wealthy bots have been able to get through the line quickly, while others who don't have enough credits have been stuck in line for days, implying that the wealthy bots are paying their way to get ahead of the line, which I can easily see happening under Prowl's nose. Another bot Blaster interviews is spouting that Die Atlas was right about the Prime's corruption and accuses Optimus of secretly keeping the lines moving slowly in order to keep the people on Cybertron. This is yet another issue I have with Die Atlas because the public statements he's made and the interview he had with Blaster in the last video has effectively spread a message that isn't entirely true. He knows Optimus is different from the Primes before him yet he's willing to paint him or let the people paint him in a negative light in order to better fit his narrative that Cybertron is over and that everyone should leave. Now from Kokular, Scorponok and Starscream are watching Blaster's broadcast. Scorponok despises and views all those leaving the planet as weaklings. Starscream defends them, explaining that most of the Energon reserves are now gone after Scorponok blew a hole in the side of the planet. Even he is unsure what's left for them on Cybertron. Conquering a world that will eventually become lifeless won't mean anything. This is where Scorponok reveals to Starscream the Cybertron he wishes to create. And this harkens back to chapter 5 when he said the strong survive and the weak are crushed beneath them. Under Scorponok's rule, Cybertron will be transformed into a tremendous gladiatory arena. Similar to Mongols War World in DC, this will be social Darwinism at its finest, survival of the fittest, where the bots left on Cybertron will be stripped of everything and have to fight to survive. Scorponok says the strong will rise and the weak will be slaughtered. 
at Metroplex, a convocation is being held. Dialis announces his resignation from the convocation and informs them of his plans to lead the Circle of Light to a new world where they will establish their own stronghold. He invites all of the factions in the convocation to join them if they give up their warmongering ways. Dialis is just coming across as high and mighty, and I like that Bulkhead calls him out and mentions that most bots can't afford or don't have the means to leave Cybertron, so if all the factions were to leave, those left behind wouldn't stand a chance if the government's administration shut down. That's significant and quite frankly, that's something I never thought about. Optimus reminds Atlas of the newly discovered raw Energon, but it still hasn't changed anything in Atlas's mind, since it is tainted Energon. Prowl interrupts the convocation, informing Optimus of a riot at the spaceport. Optimus orders all officers to converge at the spaceport, and Die Atlas tells Optimus to stand down and let the riot burn out, arguing armed officers showing up will cause a greater panic. Optimus ignores him and orders the Autobots to roll out. Meanwhile, as Skylinks is transporting Cup and the Dinobots, God, I wish, man, they used Skylinks more in the story. Love Skylinks. Anyways, he receives Optimus's orders. Cup informs the Dinobots that they have to stop at the spaceport, and they offer to help, but Cup refuses, reminding them if they lose control while at the spaceport, they'll cause even more trouble. Optimus arrives at the spaceport and sees Prowl is being overwhelmed by the riot. He tries to calm down the rioters, but but his presence only riles them up even more, to the point that they hurl an object at Prime's head. Though Dialis was right that Optimus' presence would only cause more panic, Optimus uses this opportunity to prove that he isn't like the Primes before him, to prove to the rioters that everything they've heard about him is wrong. The rioters immediately get scared after someone strikes him because they assume that Optimus is going to pull a Zeta Prime and wipe them all out, but Optimus doesn't. He doesn't respond with hostility. He explains to them that there has been enough hate and distrust and he assures them that neither he nor his officers will hurt or stop them from leaving the planet. However, he orders them to remain calm as they go through the checkpoint and tells them that freedom is their right. Now Optimus is a bit bitter here because he also tells them they can leave, especially if all they care about is their own personal safety and not the safety of others or the greater welfare of Cybertron. Afterward, Die Atlas commends Optimus for allowing everyone who wishes to leave Cybertron to go. Optimus takes this moment and tries one last time to convince Atlas to stay and help lead the people, but Atlas refuses. Even though his opinion of Optimus has slightly changed, his opinion of Cybertron hasn't. He tells Optimus that Cybertron is over, and I like that Optimus responds by calling him a hypocrite, who would rather run away and let the people and the planet die as he builds his utopia elsewhere. Optimus and Die Atlas leave each other on bad terms. Now this isn't the end of Die Atlas and the Circle of Light's journey, their story does continue in the Drift miniseries. According to the timeline, their story takes place later. But I don't see an issue in covering it now, so if you guys would like me to do that, let me know in the comments down below if you want to see that. After the Circle of Light and many more ships leave, Cup arrives with the Dinobots. Grimlock approaches Optimus, letting him know that he and the Dinobots are ready to pay for the lives lost. Initially, Optimus believes he's referring to the refinery explosion, but Grimlock reveals it all began long before that, with their last mission. This is where we learn how Scar died. Grimlock says some of what we already know, that during the mission when they began to be overwhelmed by the cyber predators, Scar rigged their alt modes testing his dynamic adaption theory. They scanned the nightmarish beasts and became just like them. Grimlock says we became monsters, we made it out, but we left the best part of who we were down in that hole. I went berserk, it was me prime. I killed Scar. I killed my best friend because I couldn't control the beast I became. All these cycles running from it and I'm tired. It needs to end. Optimus promises to do everything in his power to help them. Suddenly, Scorponok's Decepticons attack, destroying a few of the evacuating Cybertronian ships. An explosion occurs at their position. And after the explosion, Soundwave, Shockwave, Thrust, and Blackwall walk among the wreckage, killing anyone left alive. What's interesting is both Shockwave and Soundwave both expressed their disapproval of this operation, finding it reckless, flawed, and something Megatron would have never done. Nearby, Optimus, knocked out from the blast, 
awakens and sees Grimlock beginning to lose control. Optimus urges him to remember who he is, but it's too late. Grimlock transforms into his beast form and roars kill. The Decepticons, shocked at the sight of him, start getting taken out by Grimlock. He pierces Thrust's right arm and absolutely demolishes their forces one by one. Swoop and Slag try to stop him, but they get beaten back. What's funny here is as Grimlock is just taking out more Decepticons, Shockwave says, let's see if this beast can take a multi-phase fusion accelerator. Now remember, Shockwave is powerful. This is the same bot who literally one-shotted an Omega Destructor back in Autocracy. He fires directly in the face of Grimlock and it literally does nothing. And Shockwave is just like, oh, that didn't go as I expected. So realizing they have nothing else to throw at Grimlock, the Decepticons retreat. Now, as they are flying away aboard Astro Train, Starscream informs them that they won't return to Kokular, that all Decepticons have been ordered to the Terexus crater by Scorponok because he's found something big. I like that Shockwave talks trash here. He says Scorponok will show them a hole the size of his ego, and Soundwave chimes in, humor detected, conclusion, amusing. Honestly, give me a Shockwave and Soundwave comic series because I want more interactions between them. Now, back in the spaceport, Optimus wrestles Grimlock until he gains control back of his body. He sees, and so does Optimus, how they're surrounded by bodies of dead bots that consist of not only Decepticons, but some Autobots as well. Grimlock tells Optimus that this is their curse, and that there's no way of controlling it. Cup tries to reassure Grimlock that the scientists will find a way to fix him and the Dinobots. Now, despite the Dinobots wanting to stop running, they decide to leave because they don't have a way to stop themselves from causing even more destruction. And I love that Optimus tries his very best to convince them to stay. He says, don't give up hope Grimlock, I see great strength in you and the Dinobots. You can overcome the beast within you, but if you leave, you'll never stop running from your fear. You can't outrun what's inside of you. Stay and we'll face it together. Grimlock replies, Cup was right. You aren't like the other primes. It would have been an honor to serve under you, sir. After this, the Dinobots leave, and Optimus is left disheartened. From there, we transition to the Taraxis crater. And remember what I said, this is gonna end with a bang? This is gonna be that bang. As Shockwave forces arrive, they see Seekers bombing the crater. Shockwave informs Scorponok that they were defeated at the spaceport and ask him what business they have at the crater. Scorponok reveals the attack at the spaceport was only meant to create panic throughout the people to make them aware that there is no escape from what he is about to unleash. When Shockwave asks what is that, Scorponok answers he'll unleash something the Autobots discovered, something primal and uncontrollable that will bring Cybertron to its knees. At that moment, the ground begins to shake beneath them violently, and Shockwave asks Scorponok, what have you done? Scorponok replies, I have broken the locks, released the chains, and awakened a terrible wrath that this world has never seen. You will witness the dawn of the new age, survival of the fittest. The pure world Megatron envisioned could never have been won through political control or subversion. The future we forge will be born of fire and terror. It will rise from the ashes of this world, and none shall stand against it. In the face of utter ruin, the strong at last shall rise. At that moment, Trypticon comes bursting from the crater, roaring. Not hell, but death has come for Cybertron. We have finally made it to the end of Transformers Monstrosity. Hey, what's up Beyonders? James here and I hope you are hyped and ready to see this story through to the end. Let's get into it. So remember, we last left off with Trypticon being awakened by Scorponok. But before we get into that madness, we go to this awesome conversation between Alpha Trion and Optimus. We see here Optimus has lost faith in his ability to lead. He's angry and feels he has failed multiple times now because he couldn't keep Grimlock, Diatlas, 
and countless other Cybertronians from leaving. Alpha Trion tries to reassure him by explaining everyone makes their own choices, that a leader's job isn't to make decisions for his followers, but to teach them to make their own. Now Optimus wonders if his anger is based on everyone having broken free and left Cybertron while he feels chained to it, trying to achieve his impossible duty to save it and the people. Alpha Trion tries to pass on more words of wisdom until their conversation is interrupted by Jetfire. Moments later, Jetfire reports to Optimus that Scorponok has awakened Trypticon and that the Dragon Titan is decimating everything in its path. At that moment, Silverbolt reports to Optimus that the beast is heading toward the city Harmonex and that the Silver Authorities are trying to evacuate the nearby Taurus cities. Optimus orders Ironhide to assemble a strike team and Ultra Magnus to grab all the heavy ordnance he can. Later, we go to the heart of Metroplex. And I like this a lot because remember, we've been here before. We saw this in Chapter 5 of Autocracy when Optimus and the Autobots were in the Acropolis, Metroplex's former disguise. Optimus is here asking for his help and he reveals that he knows the Dragon Titan. He explains that it is a terror from a forgotten age, a spawn of Mortalis, a vast mindless engine of destruction. The ancients knew it as Trypticon. Many years ago, he fought it and helped seal it away. Now, he doesn't say that he fought alongside the Knights of Cybertron and helped them seal it away, but we know that has to be the case since Jetfire in his research found out that the Knights were the ones who sealed away Trypticon. Now, a quick explanation as to who Mortalis is. He's one of the four Transformers to come into existence after Primus. This is something IDW introduced into their Transformers continuity. These four Transformers, including Primus formed the Guiding Hand, the five gods of Cybertron, each supposedly representing an essence of Primus. Mortalus specifically represented death and using his Void Scepter created and controlled Trypticon. Fun fact, the Fallen in Transformers Revenge of the Fallen carried a Void Scepter. Optimus asks Metroplex if he will stand with him and battle Trypticon as he did before. And Metroplex answers that he cannot due to his dangerously low Energon reserves. Optimus comes to the realization that the Autobots will have to stand alone in this fight. Cycles later, we go to the outskirts of Harmonix. The Autobots see Trypticon has reached it. With the city evacuated, they're ready to set their plan in motion, which is to drop the Great Tower in the city center on top of the Titan. What's sad about that is that they don't want to do this because Harmonix, also known as the Singing City, is a beautiful city made of lithic crystals and is the center for art and learning. It's just yet another thing the Autobots have to lose on Cybertron. Optimus orders the Autobots to roll out. Sunstreaker, leading a squad, grabs Trypticon's attention, leading the beast next to the tower. Ironhide, with his heavy weapons gun crew, fires into the tower. With Trypticon distracted, Silverbolt and his aerial bots finish the job by bombarding the tower, causing it to collapse on top of the Titan, burying the beast. We're gonna transition away from that madness to yet another bad entrance in this series, and one we've all been waiting for. We go to Kokular, where Scorponok is enjoying the footage of Trypticon's destruction. Starscream approaches, informing him he is needed in the main hall because the Decepticons want to honor their true leader. Once Scorponok enters the hall, Megatron greets him. He says, it's good of you to welcome me home, Scorponok. When Scorponok questions if it's truly Megatron, Megatron says, here's a hint, and fires at him, taking out one of his legs. As he tries to crawl away, Megatron walks toward him, telling him that there is nowhere he can escape. There won't be any trial or form of exile done to him. Only death awaits him. Scorponok tries to fight back, but he is nothing compared to the might of Megatron. Megatron slams him into the ground and fires into his face. He orders the Terracons to feast on Scorponok's body, but to make sure they leave enough of him intact that his pain centers still function. They all rip into Scorponok like vultures on a corpse as he screams no. Starscream tries to buck his here by telling Megatron he's pleased to have him back. However, Megatron tells him to speak when spoken to, and that his part in the coup will be discussed later. In all reality, Starscream should have met the same fate as Scorponok, or at least should have been severely punished. 
Megatron orders Shockwave to make preparations to prepare his body and says, now somebody tell me what's been done to my world. This is one of the reasons why I love Monstrosity because Megatron really is the star of this series. He has just been awesome throughout it all. I love the way he's been written. Okay, so anyways, now we go back to Harmonex. Ironhide checks on Trypticon to see if the Dragon Titan is down for the count. He reports to Optimus that the beast isn't moving until the cyber predators burst out from beneath the rubble. Now, I don't know why I didn't think of this before, but Ratchet deduces that the cyber predators are being manufactured within Trypticon's internal foundries. As the Autobots are being overwhelmed, it gets even worse. Trypticon also rises from beneath the rubble, roaring. The Dragon Titan blasts Ironhide's heavy weapons unit out of their nest. At that moment, Optimus calls out to Trypticon, getting the Titan's attention. Now, just like Hot Rod in the Transformers 1986 film, who used the Matrix to defeat Unicron, Optimus tries to do the same thing here. He asks the Matrix to unleash its power in this desperate hour. However, his call for help goes unanswered, and the Matrix fails to open. Trypticon swats Optimus with his tail and stomps him into the ground. Sometime later, Optimus Prime is beaten and broken. In his inner monologue, he wonders if Die Atlas was right. What if the Matrix was wrong in choosing him as the new Prime? Just when Optimus is about to lose all hope, he immediately regains it when he sees not a bird, not a plane, but a ship descending. A ship carrying the Dinobots. They halo jump out of the ship as Grimlock yells, ATTACK! They land and start taking out the Cyber Predators. This was so awesome, and it's not over. Optimus is then approached by Megatron, who is fully repaired. He is here by himself because as he puts it to Optimus, he didn't want any of his soldiers to be devoured by Trypticon. That's what a good leader does, protect those who invest in him. When Optimus responds that he is no good leader, and is just as monstrous as Trypticon, Megatron tells him that despite everything he's done, he would have never released such a beast, and that it has never been his intention to bring devastation to Cybertron. Remember this, because it is important and will come back into play in the next series. He says, I should kill you now for the second time no less, but I want you to watch as I stand against this monstrosity and do what you could never do. Suddenly, Grimlock tackles him from behind while saying, you always did talk too much. Now as the two former gladiators of Kaon battle it out, Optimus reminds Grimlock not to forget who he is, trying to make sure that Grimlock doesn't lose himself to the beast inside him again. But before he can say anything else, he suddenly collapses. Grimlock and Megatron, both distracted, end up getting eaten by Trypticon. Inside Trypticon, Grimlock wants to continue the fight with Megatron, but when they both realize Trypticon's cyber predators have him surrounded, they agree to work together, for now. However, Grimlock promises Megatron, once they're done, he'll end him, which is awesome. Grimlock and Megatron battle the nightmarish creatures, and so the beasts force them to fall even deeper within Trypticon. Outside, the Autobots notice that Trypticon is heading towards Iacon next. They find Optimus and place the Matrix back within him. Even though their plan to use the Matrix failed, they refuse to give up. Back within Trypticon, Megatron saves Grimlock from falling further into the Titan. They both discover and find themselves in front of the Titan's massive plasma core. They deduce if the tanks feeding it raw energon is destroyed, it will go down for good. Their plan is, Grimlock will destroy the tanks, since he has experience with the raw volatile Energon, while Megatron covers him and deals with the Cyber Predators. Outside, Ultra Magnus suggests they withdraw and worry about Iacon. Bumblebee disagrees and thinks they should focus on the Cyber Predators. When he's about to get attacked by one, Slag saves him. The Dinobots approach and inform the Autobots that their weapons won't do anything to Trypticon, but the beast can be killed from the inside. Their only hope is Grimlock, who is still fighting inside. Within Trypticon, Grimlock is desperately trying to destroy all of its tanks, while Megatron covers him. The raw Energon begins to overwhelm him, and the beast inside begins to take over. Megatron tells him to fight the effects and says, 
fight it, damn you. He remembers Optimus's words to Grimlock and says, remember who you are. At that moment, Grimlock roars and says, I am Grimlock. He slashes the final tank and it explodes. The Dragon Titan falls. Afterwards, the Autobots celebrate the victory until Megatron approaches. He tells them that they put too much faith in the Matrix instead of real strength. That Optimus learned that lesson the hard way, and if he falls, they're nothing without him. Ultra Magnus declares he is under arrest, but Megatron just snickers because his Decepticons have arrived. The Autobots are outnumbered and outgunned. Now, they could have been wiped out here and now. Instead, Megatron allows them to leave in honor of what they fought for today, but does inform them he will take possession of Trypticon. Ironhide points his blaster at him and refuses to allow Megatron to have the Titan. Grimlock appears and tells Ironhide without the volatile Energon, Trypticon is nothing but a heap of scrap. Megatron reminds Grimlock of his promise to end him, but Grimlock tells him he'll decide when and where they'll settle the score. As the Autobots depart, Skywarp asks Megatron if they should kill the Autobots here and now. Megatron replies, no, let them crawl back and nurse their wounds. Soon, the game will begin anew. I will bring war upon the Autobots unlike anything they can imagine. And in that hour, Megatron shall at last reign supreme. Now the story could have ended there, but no, we get more. Later, within Trypticon, Megatron takes Pentius's spark and connects it with Trypticon's core. The Titan of Death rises again as a Decepticon. Megatron now possesses the power of a Titan. I cannot wait to bring you guys the final arc of the Autocracy Trilogy, Primacy, where Megatron will bring hell, fire, and death to Cybertron and the Autobots. We now return to the Transformers. Hey, what's up everyone? James here and I'm coming at you with the final series in the Autocracy Trilogy, Primacy. This final series is amazing. It might be the best in the trilogy. If you are new here or behind and need to catch up and haven't watched the two previous series, Transformers Autocracy and Monstrosity that I've covered on the channel, check out the IDW Transformer Timeline playlist I'll have in a pinned comment down below. You can watch all the videos separately or check out the full story videos I made of them in the playlist. With that being said, let's get into it. So, Primacy begins with recapping the events of Monstrosity. It says, it began with a catastrophe that devastated Cybertron's Energon reserves. This led many Cybertronians to give up on Cybertron and leave, an event that would be known as the Great Exodus. However, the pain and suffering Cybertron would endure did not end there. Scorponok, who betrayed Megatron and took over the Decepticons, awakened the Titan of Death and Horror, Trypticon. It rampaged across the planet until the most dangerous Cybertronian alive returned to Cybertron, Megatron, who saved the planet by ending Scorponok's reign of destruction and by helping Grimlock stop the mighty Titan. Now, all is quiet on Cybertron, but this peace will not last for long. Our story really begins at McAdams Oil House, which is basically a bar on Cybertron. Everyone is watching Blaster's broadcast. He is sharing the report given by the Conclave of Representatives on the crisis that took place in Harmonex, basically Trypticon's rampage. Now the reason why the Autobots government is called the Conclave of Representatives now and not the Grand Convocation anymore is because it basically failed after Die Atlas and the Circle of Light left, so it was restructured and renamed. It's really Optimus trying to introduce a more democratic form of government on Cybertron. Now this report displays Optimus' administration is using the same media tactics as the former administration under Sentinel and Zeta Prime used before. The report claims that Optimus and the Autobots defeated Trypticon, which we know isn't true, but honestly this is what they should report 
They can't mention Grimlock because he and the Dinobots are essentially ghosts, and reporting that Megatron helped defeat Trypticon wouldn't make their administration look too good. It might even gain him more supporters. Also, Blaster mentions that there are bots claiming the media is being kept away from Harmonix. And the Conclave has refused to reveal the total number of bots who left during the Great Exodus. So Blaster poses the question to the people, is Optimus' administration lying to them? And if so, are they just as bad as all the others before them? Now who is at McAdams Oil House that was missing in action in Monstrosity that we finally get to see again is Hot Rod. He is fresh out of the Autobot Academy and is here having this debate with his friend at the bar about whether they can trust Optimus' government or not. Hot Rod argues that he doesn't care for the Conclave, but he believes in Optimus Prime. He knows that the Decepticons want to just burn everything, and he's seen enough things burn. Moments later, when he leaves the bar, this shadowy figure approaches, who turns out to be Slinger. He reveals he's part of the Decepticons now and considers them the real people's movement. They fixed him up, gave him a new form, and made him into a fighter. He tells Hot Rod that wearing the Autobot badge is a disgrace to everyone who died in Nyon. Hot Rod fires back, telling Slinger not to judge him and that he knows he had no choice that day. Slinger makes it clear to Hot Rod that from here on out, he needs to watch his back. Now this switch up from Slinger is legit out of nowhere. It really doesn't make any sense. And even him judging Hot Rod for blowing up Nyon doesn't make sense. I'm kind of going to go on a tangent here and explain this, but if you don't care, you can just skip this part using the chapters below. So back in Autocracy Chapter 6, initially Hot Rod hesitated on activating the phase chargers to blow up Nyon until Slinger said, it is better that our people die at our hands than be drained to serve Zeta's war machine. At the end of Autocracy, Slinger told Bumblebee that he and the survivors of Nyon would essentially become chroniclers of Cybertron's history. Then, going into Monstrosity, the last time we saw him, he was a part of the Grand Convocation, representing Cybertronians who are unaligned with any faction. It's for those reasons why I say this big shift in his character doesn't make any sense. I wish this big shift in Slinger were built up instead of popping out of nowhere. But let me know what you all think about this change in his character. Anyways, now in Cybertron's southern polar region, we see Optimus and Ironhide scaling the Grav Haran Glacier that has stood there for 50 million years. It's a place that hasn't been visited in millions of years. Prime is here because he wants to clear his mind after the events of Monstrosity, and he's also here to train and test his limits. And I like this a lot because though the Transformers are these super advanced robots, they don't get better by installing new programs or new software. And yes, of course, they can gain power through objects or modifying their forms. Still, at the end of the day, they need to become stronger just like us by working towards it. Eventually, Optimus and Ironhide reach the summit. Ironhide detects they're not alone. Using his binoculars, he sees a huge object on the horizon, giving off a serious Energon signature. They end up going to investigate. Meanwhile, at Icon in Metroplex, Hot Rod arrives, where he learns at Ultra Magnus and Cup are anxiously waiting for Ratchet and Wheeljack's Energon purification treatment on the Dinobots to be finished. Grimlock is the last one being treated, and they're slightly worried that it may not work since Grimlock's Energon corruption ran the deepest. They shortly see the treatment was successful. When Grimlock emerges from the operating room, not only did Wheeljack and Ratchet clear the Dinobots of the raw corrupt Energon, but also re-engineered them back to their old forms when they were in the Primal Vanguard. Now, how a drill sergeant doesn't show respect to a fresh recruit in the military, Grimlock kind of does the same thing here to Hot Rod. When Hot Rod voices how he can't wait to kick some Decepticon butt alongside the Dinobots, Grimlock basically tells him they're not on the same level and that he has to prove himself first before he gets any respect. Transitioning back to Ironhide and Optimus after traversing the glacier, they finally reach the source of the Energon signature they detected, which is revealed to be a huge bot that Optimus immediately recognizes. This bot is an Omega Sentinel. 
Now, some of you I'm sure already know who this is. I might even put this in the title of the video, but I'm not gonna say who it is just yet. So for those of you who don't know about the Omega Sentinels, in the Transformers IDW universe, they are ancient beings that were the first generation of Guardian robots. They were tasked with being the Guardians of Crystal City, where the 13 Primes reigned. At one point, they were even used to conquer other planets. They're somewhat similar to the Omega Destructors we saw back in Autocracy, who are basically the second generation of Guardian robots. Optimus tries to greet the Mighty Bob, and though it's surprised to see other beings, it immediately points its blaster at Optimus and Ironhide, demanding it must not be disturbed because it's waiting for the Prime's return. Initially, it doesn't believe Optimus when he says he is the Prime until he reveals he carries the Matrix of Leadership. This is where Optimus discovers the exact Prime the Sentinel has been waiting to return is Nova Prime the original Prime who united Cybertron. I won't go into detail on Nova Prime in this video because I plan on eventually making a video of an issue that gives his origin and history on Crystal City, amongst other things that's really cool. Optimus informs the Sentinel that Nova and his expedition have been lost for millions of cycles. He asks the Sentinel to join them and serve the people again. It agrees to join him and vows to follow the bearer of the Matrix. It offers to take them back to Iacon. After it transforms, Optimus asks, what shall we call you? The Sentinel answers, Supreme. I am Omega Supreme. Yes, Optimus has gained the leader and strongest of the Omega Sentinels. From there, we go to my favorite part in this issue. Megatron, with his Decepticon forces still at the ruins of Harmonix. Remember, Monstrosity ended with Megatron giving Trypticon Pentius' spark, reviving the Titan of Death. And since then, Megatron has reflected on everything that transpired in Monstrosity and has had a revelation. He shares it with Trypticon as the beast sleeps. He explains that Scorponok believed Trypticon was just a mindless beast of destruction, just wanting to unleash its fury on Cybertron, hoping it would eliminate the weak from the world. But he was wrong. Chaos isn't what will transform Cybertron, but control. He says we will together bring ruin upon all those who oppose us. This world shall be ours. So swears Megatron. He mentions how he can feel Pentius' spark coursing within Trypticon. And the reason why he can feel it is because Megatron still has remnants of Pentius' spark within himself. So he and Trypticon sort of share a spark bond. Suddenly, Trypticon awakens and calls him Wanderer as Pentius did. When Megatron asks if he is Pentius, Trypticon answers no and yes. Really, I would say he is a combination of both. He agrees with Megatron that Cybertron will be theirs, but they will have to burn the world first and create a perfect one from the ashes. He questions Megatron if he has the will to do this. Megatron brushes over his resolve being questioned because he is more focused on Pentius possibly being in control of Trypticon since he really can't be trusted. He asks Trypticon how much of Pentius lives inside of him. Trypticon answers that his memories are scattered, dark flashes of the ages long past. All he can remember are feelings of cruelty, malice, and hatred for everything that lives. Megatron becomes furious because it doesn't answer the question if these are Trypticon's memories or Pentius. Through the spark bond they share, Trypticon shows Megatron the memories he sees. In these memories, Megatron sees Trypticon striding across a vast, desolate, lifeless field where Cybertron's first battle took place, the Battle of Gods. He sees another world, Junkion, breaking apart, pieces of it drifting into the void of space, taking with it the people's dreams and aspirations. He sees Devils, the Quintessence bringing death to entire civilizations and birthing monstrosities. Countless worlds burning cycle after cycle. The memories begin to overwhelm Megatron and he orders Trypticon to stop. 
Trypticon tells Megatron that he will understand in time the scale of such evil. The memories don't shake Megatron's determination. He explains they only confirm what he's known all along. That the universe is split between those that are weak and those that are strong. He says, serve me well Trypticon and rise. When the Decepticons arrive, Megatron gives this awesome speech. He says, War is coming, my Decepticons. Our final hour of vengeance draws near. But many of our forces were scattered when the Autobots retook Iacon from us. And many others abandoned the Decepticon cause when Scorponok took control of leadership. In short, our numbers are too few to launch a full-scale assault on the Autobots. For now, with the aid of the mighty Trypticon, we will leave Cybertron and gather our full strength. Gather our long lost brethren back into the fold. Later, flying above Taraxis aboard Skylynx, Hot Rod informed Skylynx that Magnus wanted them to fly over Harmonex after they were done in order to see Trypticon's condition. We see through the lens of Hot Rod and Grimlock that the Autobots rebuilt the Taraxis mega refinery. It's drawing on the raw volatile energon they discovered deep beneath the caverns and are able to purify it at an accelerated rate, solving the issue of the energon shortage crisis they were facing. Harrod sees it as hope and power for Cybertron, but Grimlock doesn't. They get into an argument here and Grimlock explains he could never look at it that way because the Taraxis caverns and the Energon took away his best friend and turned him into a monster. Hot Rod's response to this shows us not only how much he's grown since autocracy but also shows us how he's starting to sound like Optimus. He reminds Grimlock that he and the Dinobots are cured and have a fresh start, that holding on to all that pain and guilt will just burn up inside of him. This enrages Grimlock, and he tells Hot Rod he knows nothing of guilt and pain, which we know isn't true. If anyone else carries a lot of guilt and pain, it's Hot Rod. The guy had to kill his own people. Suddenly their argument gets interrupted when Skylinks tells them to look outside, and that's when they both see Trypticon is gone. At that moment, in orbit above Cybertron, Megatron and the Decepticons are aboard Trypticon, ready to depart and bring back the mightiest army this universe has ever seen. You are going to go nuts at the end of this video. Oh man, it's going to be awesome. Hey, what is up everyone? James here and we are back with primacy this video is going to be so good we are going to see in this video megatron form his mighty army we'll see some decepticon subgroups and it's going to be awesome if you are new here check out the playlist in the pinned comment down below and subscribe to join the beyonders if you want more transformers content Okay, so part two opens on this planet called Magmara 9, also known as the Cauldron. It was known as a world of wealth, prosperity, and shining cities, but is now known as a lawless outland of broken highways. Strongbox is here transporting goods on this planet, and I feel bad for him because he just keeps getting ambushed. He got ambushed by the Dinobots and Monstrosity, and now here on the Cauldron, he is getting ambushed by the Decepticons, Psycho Evil Speedsters, and kings of the road, the Stunticons. In the comics, they first appeared in Transformers Marvel UK issue number 63, and it was titled Second Generation, where Buster with Wiki in a terrible nightmare saw them in a vision of a possible future. On the show, they were the second combiner team introduced after the Constructicons in the cartoon series, making their appearance in season two. The roster consists of Wild Rider, Breakdown, Dead End, Dragstrip, and the leader of the group, Motormaster. Now, being a combiner team allows them to come together and form the powerful Metasaur. They end up surrounding Strongbox, and even though he tries to assure them he isn't carrying anything valuable, they ignore him because Swindle's tip to them said otherwise. Now, you would think with a name like Strongbox, he would be impenetrable or at least very durable, but nope. The Stunticons smash him and send him flying over the bridge here. They open him up, but discover Thundercracker was the cargo Strongbox was carrying. Thundercracker reveals this was all a ruse. He set this all up in order to see if the Stunticons haven't lost their edge. Initially, Motormaster assumes Scorponok put him up to this, until Thundercracker reveals Megatron is back, and he's got the biggest heist for them, stealing Cybertron. 
The next planet we visit is Canis Tor. It was once known as a lush jungle world with complex ecosystems and species of every kind. At least that was until five predators arrived months ago. Now Canis Tor is a vast, lifeless graveyard, and the predators responsible for this are the greatest, in my opinion, of the Decepticon subgroups, the original Predacons. When it comes to the Predacons, they first appeared in the comics in issue 96 of the Transformers Marvel UK comics titled Prey, where the Decepticons summoned them to hunt down Optimus Prime. They popped up in season 3 of the cartoon series. Their group is composed of bots whose alt forms are all fierce animals. I like to think of them as the Decepticons answer to the Autobots Dinobots. Razorclaw is the leader and his alt form is a lion. Rampage's alt form is a tiger. Dive Bombs is an eagle. Headstrong is a rhino and Tantrum is a bull. Now what separates them from the Dinobots is they can combine together, they're combiners, and they form the most powerful combiner of all, Predaking. A combiner who is unstoppable and is second to none in battle. Right now the Predacons have put themselves in quite a predicament. Because of their insatiable hunger, they've wiped out all life on the planet. Now that they're running low on Energon and have no way off this planet, they've started turning on each other. As Razorclaw and Rampage are fighting, the rest of the Predacons mention the only thing left is to feed on each other. When Dive Bomb passes out, that becomes a reality. But before the Predacons dine on his corpse, Astro Train descends on the planet with Starscream. Razorclaw reminds Starscream that he told him he had no interest in serving Scorponok and that he swore an oath to Megatron. Starscream replies, Megatron has returned. Your master calls. The hunt begins anew. Are you in or out? Meanwhile, as Megatron creates his mighty army, back on Cybertron, Optimus and Alpha Trion discuss the discovery of Omega Supreme that happened in the last video. Optimus mentions that ever since they returned to Iacon, Supreme has been watching over him non-stop that he was hoping he would acclimate well, become a part of Cybertronian society again, and a part of the Autobots. However, Alphatron makes a very good point. He reminds Optimus that Omega Supreme stood watch for millions of years. It's going to take time for him to acclimate to others in this new world, this new time, that it might take a million years for him to find himself again. There is a lot more to Supreme's story that we'll learn later, and I really can't wait for that. Now returning to the Decepticons, we go to this planet called the Presidium, a former garrison of Nominus Prime. The Combaticons who are here are trying to steal an old cache of weapons. Nominus Prime had sealed away here because they were considered too dangerous to keep on Cybertron. Now like the Stunticons, they appeared in Buster Witwicky's nightmare possible vision of the future in Transformers Marvel UK issue 63, second generation. In the cartoon series, they were the third Decepticon combiner team introduced, appearing in Season 2. What makes them so different though when compared to the Predacons and Stunticons is they operate with military precision because of their leader, Onslaught, who is a brilliant tactician. The rest of the members are Brawl, who is a loud brawler, hence the name, Blastoff, Vortex, who is the interrogator and Joker-like bot of the group because he likes to torture people, and Swindle, who we know is an information broker and dealer in black market goods, among other things. As they are trying to break into this safe, they realize the passcodes Swindle got aren't working and end up being locked out of the system. Before Onslaught blows a hole into Swindle, the safe doors suddenly open, revealing Starscream and the Predacons. Starscream reveals he allowed the passcodes to fall into Swindle's hands in order to lure them here, and mentions he doesn't want the weapons, he wants them for the war of reckoning and destruction that is to come. The big payout he promises convinces them to join. Out in deep space aboard Trypticon, Soundwave informs Megatron that the full force of the Decepticons is nearly assembled and that they have arrived at their destination. However, Megatron senses Soundwave's doubt and tells Soundwave to speak his fear. Soundwave says that this final world that they've arrived at is death and madness. But before he speaks further, Megatron cuts him off. 
He reveals the sound wave he considers him to be the most faithful and loyal of his soldiers, but questioning his judgment is dangerous. The Megatron he knew is gone, and he will not be denied. This final planet, which I'm sure a lot of you probably already figured out that Trypticon descends upon, is the Death World Junkion. The junk zombies begin to close in and gather around the ship, ready to feast. But when Megatron emerges from the ship, they stop in their tracks. He asks if they remember him, and each one of them has a different name for him. They say Stranger Destroyer, Wreckage Demon, and The Ruined King. Megatron says, kneel before your master, kneel before Megatron. All the junk zombies bow before him, submitting to their king. Megatron orders them to gather all their clans, instruments of war, and prepare their ship. They're leaving with him and leaving the ghosts of this hell behind. I not only love this because it is so sick, but also because it's basically the opposite of what happened in Transformers the movie. Where in the film, Hot Rod met the Junkions, and after exchanging the universal greeting and a random dance party, quickly became friends, and ended up joining Hot Rod and the Autobots in their battle against Unicron. Sometime later on Cybertron at Metroplex, Bulkhead informs Optimus that their long-range scanners picked up something big heading their way. Initially, Optimus thinks it's Cybertronians returning who left during the Great Exodus, but when Bulkhead says this object has a massive Energon signature, Optimus quickly deduces it's Trypticon and the Decepticons. Hot Rod suggests shooting it down, but Bulkhead tells him the raining debris would be catastrophic to the planet. While Optimus wonders what Megatron's target is, Grimlock and Hot Rod have already figured it out. They are sure Megatron plans on dropping Trypticon right on top of them. And this is where it gets nuts. At that moment, above the planet, that's exactly what Megatron is doing. He says, Trypticon, it's time. Give my regards to Metroplex. Trypticon replies, with pleasure, Lord Megatron. Notice that the Decepticons are now aboard the Junkion ship, which is Pentius's Quintesson cruiser we saw back in Monstrosity. As Trypticon is descending like a missile, Bumblebee informs Optimus if they don't slow him down, he'll level Iacon in every Taurus state. With no time left, Optimus orders Teletran to initiate Gamma Defense Protocols. Teletran reroutes all city Energon batteries to the primary Titan core. You all know what that means. Optimus orders all Autobots to abandon the facility and says to Metroplex, we need your strength, mighty one. Now more than ever, it's time to stand and defend. Metroplex replies, order acknowledge. Do not fear, all will be well. Once he fully transforms, it is at that moment Trypticon crash lands on top of Metroplex, toppling the mighty Titan and destroying the city's center. As Trypticon's jaws loom over Metroplex's head, he says, It's good to see you again, old Titan. It's been far, far too long. We now return to the Transformers. This video is going to be absolutely insane. What's up everyone? This is James and we are back with Primacy. Remember that epic cliffhanger I left you all on in the last video? That was just the start of the chaos and the battle of titans you're about to witness in this video. So we start right where we left off with the colossal ancient titans of death and hope battling. Their fight is so intense that it's emitting shockwaves all across Cybertron. In a brief break in their epic battle, Metroplex says, I remember you, beast of perfect darkness, and I'll seal you back beneath the world where you belong. Trypticon replies, You can try, old Titan, but the horror and terrible violence that's coming to Cybertron cannot be stopped even by you. They exchange mighty blasts, and their fight continues. Meanwhile, below the surface, Optimus contacts Omega Supreme to check the status of Megatron's ship since the link to Iacon's orbital sensors have been disrupted. 
Omega reports that it's just sitting in low orbit, doing nothing. Some of the Autobots assume that Megatron is waiting for Trypticon to defeat Metroplex so he can make his move. And Optimus agrees, but he senses they are missing something, that it seems like Megatron is six steps ahead of them. At that moment, in orbit, Megatron orders Soundwave to prepare the ship for violent re-entry and says, this is the hour of our ascension, Soundwave. Try to enjoy it. Back at the Battle of Titans, Metroplex is losing. Trypticon standing over him taunts him, saying you are far weaker than I remember. You know you cannot beat me. Just lay down and die. Metroplex grabs a building and smashes Trypticon in the face while yelling, it's you who shall fall. As Trypticon falls over, he tries to strike Metroplex with his tail, but the Great Titan sees the attack coming and blasts his tail off. However, Trypticon still lands an attack when he strikes Metroplex's knee, causing him to collapse to his knees. The fight becomes just a knockdown, drag out fight. They're just exchanging blows while on the ground. Eventually, Metroplex shows Trypticon who is the superior Titan when he grabs Trypticon's head and smashes it into a building. He says, all the years have taught me how to stand even in pain. He completely shatters Trypticon's jaw, finally defeating the beast. But it's not over. Trypticon says, you are victorious, Titan, but you still lose. Now, Metroplex believes he's just speaking nonsense and replies, you are beaten. You pose no threat to me. Trypticon laughs and reveals that his job wasn't to defeat him, only to distract him. Cause out of nowhere, Metroplex gets impaled by the Quintessen Cruiser. Optimus yells, no, Metroplex, the Titan of Hope has fallen. Now, do you think the insaneness of this video ends there? you would be so wrong. Because within the Quintessen Cruiser, Megatron orders the Decepticons to ready for battle and kill everything that moves. He says, all the pieces are set. Our moment is now. Let Iacon burn. At the same time, in the Autobot Command Bunker, the Autobots are just dealing with the loss of Metroplex and wondering how many troops Megatron has with him. Optimus orders the Autobots to prepare for battle, giving this great war speech. He says, we must protect this city. This may be the fight of our lives. Whatever we face out there, remember who you are, Autobots, and what you are fighting for. The Autobots roll out and form up in front of the Quintessen Cruiser. The cargo bay doors open and Megatron unleashes hell. A massive wave of junk zombies pours out of the ship. The final battle for Cybertron begins. The Autobots get swarmed, overwhelmed by the sheer number of junk zombies. It's insane, it's crazy. Prowl suggests that they pull back, but Optimus Prime refuses. He yells, we will hold the line. This situation is bad and it gets a lot worse. Jetfire and Perceptor radio to Optimus that the junk ship not only pierced Metroplex, but penetrated Iacon substructure, compromising the city's primary coolant plants. Perceptor tells Optimus that he has minutes until the unprocessed coolant floods the city center. At that moment, it's too late. The coolant reaches the surface and creates a small scale ocean. And once it interacts with Cybertron's atmosphere, it produces highly concentrated acid rain. Megatron has created the perfect habitat for something else he brought from Junkion the Sharktacons. Megatron watches and enjoys the nightmare he's created. Everything has gone to plan. This is a great example of Megatron's genius. He successfully brought the dangerous elements of Junkion that he faced to Cybertron. He orders the Decepticons to wait for the Autobots forces to whittle down more before they attack. The Sharktacons are doing exactly that. The Autobots are struggling. They have the Junk Zombies and now the Sharktacons to contend with. Optimus Prime, Hot Rod, and Grimlock are fighting side by side against these monstrosities. Grimlock and Hot Rod get into a bit of an argument during the heat of battle, but Optimus stops it. He gives an amazing speech that epitomizes the difference between the Autobots and Decepticons. He says, both of you enough. Don't you see? It's honor and loyalty that binds us together. That's the difference between us and the Decepticons. 
For all his vision, Megatron's followers are only motivated by mistrust, fear, and blind obedience. Whereas we will stand and fight for each other. Now Autobots, lay down suppressive fire! The Autobots take down a wave of Sharktacons. Megatron is impressed, but this was anticipated. He orders the Combaticons and the Seekers to encircle the field and lock on to Target Alpha. We'll learn who Target Alpha is in a second. In the meantime, at the battle's center, Blackwall ambushes Grimlock, wanting to reminisce their gladiator days and have a rematch. I didn't realize just how much he towers over Grimlock. He starts beating down Grimlock and taunting him as he does it. He tells Grimlock he is nothing without his beast mode and that he and the Dinobots should have stayed hidden. Grimlock and the Dinobots get separated from the rest of the Autobots and the Decepticons are closing in on them. Bumblebee tells this to Optimus, but Optimus cannot help them because Megatron will overrun their strong point if he splits his forces. So he finally calls in the big guns, Omega Supreme. He orders Supreme to bombard Megatron's position in order to scatter his command group. Before Omega follows Optimus's order though, he admits he lied to him and reveals the real truth behind his isolation. He says, I did not endure countless cycles of isolation out of some loyalty to Nova Prime. I waited for him to return so I could destroy him. He was a corrupt disgrace to the Primes I once served, but you, are nothing like him. I see greatness in you. These Decepticons have ravaged the world I love. They remind me of Nova, who sought dominion over others. I'll follow your order, Optimus Prime. I will bring justice down upon them. However, it's too late. Megatron was already aware and ready for Omega Supreme. He is Target Alpha. Megatron orders the Combaticons and Seekers to take him down. They unleash firepower hell upon him. Omega Supreme falls. The Autobots are on the edge of defeat. Megatron orders both assault groups to keep firing and pulverize anything that moves. Suddenly, in that moment where Megatron believes he is close to victory, he hears laughter from a disembodied voice. The voice says, your fury is magnificent, Wanderer. Megatron immediately recognizes who this is. It's Pentius. He asks how can he hear his voice, and Pentius reveals he has always been there, living within the remnants of his spark. He says, foolish little conqueror, I am part of you, and through you, I will devour your precious Cybertron. We have finally made it to the end of Transformers Primacy. What's up everyone, James here. Before we go into the video, if you are new here or need to catch up, the Transformers Primacy playlist will be in a pinned comment down below. Also, make sure you stick to the very end of the video because your input is needed on what we cover next in IDW's Transformer timeline. With that being said, let's not waste any more time and get right into it. So continuing where we last left off, the battle for Cybertron continues. The Decepticons are continuing to concentrate all firepower on the Autobots position. They're all enjoying the devastation and believe the Autobots are defeated, except Megatron. He believes they could still lose the battle, but right now he's distracted because he's being haunted by the spirit of Pentius. He realizes that Pentius manipulated him into taking his spark and reviving him. As that's happening, the acid rain Megatron created in the last video is now affecting the Decepticon forces. Skywarp reports to Starscream that the Seeker's instruments are going haywire and engines are burning out. They end up falling out of the sky and landing right on top of the Combaticon tank unit, causing chaos within the Decepticon command point. This leads to my favorite part in this story. The Autobots come back. At that moment, after the dust settles from the Decepticons barrage, not only did the Autobots survive the barrage due to Trailbreaker's shield, but who else survived was Omega Supreme. Optimus sees the Decepticons are in disarray. He tells the Autobots this is where they push back and asks Supreme, are you fit for duty? Omega replies, merely singed Optimus, I am ready to fight. For my people. Optimus says, very well then. Autobots, attack! They charge the Decepticons and both sides clash. 
the image of this is absolutely amazing. And it's nice seeing my boy Skylynx enter the fray. At the Decepticon command point, Soundwave informs Megatron that the Autobots are breaking through the forward lines, and they're losing the advantage. However, Megatron is still distracted by Pentius. He tells Soundwave he's leaving to reach Trypticon's body, and that if he should fail in his mission, the Decepticons are to retreat and burn Iacon to the ground. What's going on with Megatron, if you're confused, is Pentius is slowly taking over Megatron, and once he does, he would revive his spark in Trypticon so he could continue the destruction of Cybertron. At the Eastern Grid, Blackwall is trying to snap Grimlock's head off. He tells Grimlock once he takes his head, he'll take his fire sword as a trophy. Grimlock says, you want the sword so bad, Blackwall? You can have it. He stabs it into Blackwall's head and rips it apart. Grimlock proving he's still one of the greatest gladiators. Also at the Eastern Grid elsewhere, Hot Rod is taking out Decepticons. Onslaught catches him off guard. Now how Onslaught ended up here when he was clearly with the Decepticon main force doesn't matter because who ends up taking him out and saving Hot Rod is Slinger. He admits that he was wrong. Being an Autobot or a Decepticon doesn't matter anymore. Cybertron is broken. Suddenly, from behind Slinger, a voice says, No, just you, traitor. This voice is Razorclaw. He grips and pierces Slinger's eyes as the rest of the Predacons rip his limbs off. It's such a ruthless kill. They tell Hot Rod, he's going to meet the same fate. Havar replies, it's not going to be easy, Predacon. Now, Chris Metzen and Flint and Dilly don't let this trilogy end without another badass entrance from the Dinobots. Because as the Predacons are closing in on Hot Rod, coming out of the smoke from the battlefield behind him is the Dinobots. Grimlock says, I think they almost believed you. Next time, use your big boy voice. The Dinobots charge the Predacons and the two groups clash. Meanwhile, Megatron reaches Trypticon. Bumblebee and this pair of Autobots are guarding it. They threaten Megatron not to come any closer. That turns out being a big mistake. Megatron quickly demolishes the pair of Autobots. They had no chance. Bumblebee fires at him and Megatron just eats the hit. He tells Bumblebee how he thought he would run since he's experienced torture at his hands. He's referring to Autocracy Chapter 10, when Megatron had the Autobots as prisoners. As Megatron grips him, Bumblebee can see he fears something. Megatron, impressed by Bumblebee's courage and perception, still impales Bumblebee on some debris. Nearby, Optimus Prime sees Megatron reaching Trypticon and chases after him, but who ends up getting in his way is Motormaster, who says, the only way you're getting to Megatron is through me. Optimus replies, fair enough. The two semis put the pedal to the metal and charge toward each other. Optimus tears through Motormaster, proving who is the real king of the road. The rest of the Stunticons try to circle up and flank Optimus, but at that moment, a shadow looms over them, saying, you will not touch him. This shadow is Omega Supreme. He says, you will all be eradicated. He unleashes a massive blast that ends the Stunticons. Optimus reaches Megatron atop the head of Trypticon. He says, Megatron, you're not going any further. You've brought enough misery and destruction to Cybertron. This is where Megatron cryptically speaks of the vision Trypticon showed him back in Primacy Part 1. He replies, you speak of destruction, but know nothing of it. The madness and carnage that's been unleashed here won't end. It will echo from Cybertron. Countless worlds will suffer across the millennia, and our war will never end. Optimus refuses to believe that. Megatron calls him a fool and says, this is our fate. Optimus replies, not while I function. Help me stop this. Our story doesn't have to end here. They both draw their Energon weapons and run toward each other. A nice callback to the original Transformers cartoon, where in the episode More Than Meets the Eye Part 2, Megatron and Optimus Prime had their first Energon weapons one-on-one -on -one clash. They start exchanging blows. As they battle, Megatron tells Optimus he tried creating a better world by bringing order, but now he believes Cybertron has only death in its future. 
When Optimus refuses to believe this, Megatron reveals the existence of the Quintessons. He says, there are devils that lurk in the darkness, between the stars, hungering for the annihilation of all life. I was deceived, Optimus. I stole an uncontrollable power, and now it will devour Cybertron. There is no hope for any of us. Optimus responds with that eternal optimism we know he possesses, delivering a great speech. He says, you are wrong. Whatever it is you've set in motion isn't insurmountable. Yes, fear may grip us all, and the heavens themselves may come crashing down upon our heads, but the brave fight on. We will never bow or succumb to the abyss of defeat. As long as we stand together and fight for each other, we will never lose hope. At that moment in the Eastern Grid, the battle between the Dinobots and Hot Rod versus the Predacons is still raging on. Grimlock and Hot Rod together are taking on Razorclaw, who is giving them quite a fight. What happens next is why I love Grimlock. Grimlock grabs Razorclaw's jaw, Hot Rod holds him down, and Grimlock pulls a King Kong and tears Razorclaw's jaws apart. That's what you get when you mess with the king of the Dinobots. Back atop Trypticon, the battle between Optimus Prime and Megatron is becoming just a knockdown, drag out fight. They are just battering away at each other with their Energon weapons. Megatron points out that this will be their lives for millions of years. Optimus, not wanting that future, tries to speak to that Megatron who sought to rebel against the Autobot Senate's corruption that we saw in his origin, urging him to work together and end the evil he's unleashed. But Megatron believes it's too late. He tells Optimus Pentius is devouring him from the inside and that the only way to save Cybertron is to destroy him. Optimus, refusing to accept that that is the only way, opens his chest plate, revealing the matrix of leadership. He says, if it's darkness that has consumed you, then let there be light. He unleashes the massive burning power of the Matrix on Megatron, purging Pentius from his spark. I wish we got to see Pentius being eradicated. The only thing we get is Megatron tells Optimus he can no longer hear Pentius's laughter. Optimus says the malignance has been expunged, but we both know your spark was corrupted long before this. Megatron replies, perhaps. Cybertron's death has been prevented, but know this Optimus Prime, I will never stop hating you. Optimus simply says, I know, and knocks out Megatron. Moments later, Optimus beams out a huge hologram transmission across the ravaged battlefield, announcing to all the Autobots and Decepticons that the battle is over. He says, we have all suffered and lost comrades in this madness. Time to stand down and lay down your arms. Look around and see the terrible cost of war. This city was once the shining heart of our civilization. For all our aspirations and principles, I don't see justice or order amid the wreckage. All I see is loss, and I've had enough of it. The Decepticons will face the consequences of their actions. Make no mistake, there will be a reckoning. True order and harmony can never be instilled through the threat of tyrannical control. The society we long for cannot be built through the pillars of domination and fear. We will restore some semblance of civil order and begin to rebuild this world we've sacrificed so much to save. At the same time, we can never hope to seal away the sins of the past. We must never forget the lessons our mistakes have taught us. If we ever forget the terrible cost of war, we will lose more than just the hope of a better future. Ultimately, we will lose ourselves. The war for Cybertron ends with Optimus and the Autobots victorious, Megatron in prison, and the Decepticons scattered. We go to an epilogue, and it's so fitting that the last page here has the same panels that are on the first page of Autocracy Chapter 1, but in reverse order, and of course, with some changes, bringing the entire trilogy full circle. Optimus Prime says, Once I was known as Orion Pax. I was an officer a peacekeeper, but I have found a new life, a new calling. With the power of the Matrix coursing within me, I will stand for my people, for all those who cannot stand for themselves. With my Autobots at my side, I will fight to the last, for freedom, for justice, 
for Cybertron. I am Optimus Prime, and my story is only just beginning. That is the end of Primacy, and the end of Transformers The Autocracy Trilogy. I would like to thank Chris Medzen, Flint Dilly, and Livio Remindelli for creating such an awesome story. The reason why I titled this video The Fall of Cybertron is because though the planet itself didn't fall, the society and its cities did. Also, it's a great title, one of the games had. In all seriousness though, everything that occurred in this trilogy caused the death of everything the Cybertronians knew. Another reason why is because our journey on Cybertron ends for now at least, and we will now head into the Great War continuing on Earth with the next series on the timeline, Infiltration. However, there is a crossover event called ROM vs Transformers Shining Armor that takes place before Infiltration. Let me know in the comments down below which would you like to see next. Now if you enjoyed the video, hit that like button and subscribe. Other than that, have an awesome day, and always remember, every day, to transform and go beyond. See you later, Beyonders.